Coming up, Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Good morning to you. It's six o'clock on Sunday, the 24th of March. Today, Kensington Palace has revealed the Princess of Wales is enormously touched by the outpouring of support from across the world following her cancer diagnosis. The Russian President Vladimir Putin has declared a day of mourning following the deaths of about 133 in a Moscow terrorist attack. He's also made unsubstantiated claims about Ukraine's involvement in it. 
claims today that China has been targeting senior politicians at Westminster through a string of cyber attacks, as four senior MPs are called to an urgent meeting. And as landmarks around the world switched off the lights for Earth Hour, we'll be debating whether or not you care about Earth Hour and what it's about, really. And after all the talk of the flag on the back of the neck, England had their collars felt at Wembley as a 17-year-old scored Brazil's late winner. Meanwhile, the Australian Grand Prix has just finished. Find out who won and who crashed out later this hour. Hello, today looks much quieter weather-wise across the UK than on Saturday. There'll be more in the way of sunshine around and lighter winds too. And with those lighter winds, it should feel a bit warmer. I'll have all the details a little bit later. Morning to you, I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Anne Diamond and this is Breakfast on GB News. I have to say, a lot of people got in touch yesterday um, saying, can you not talk about anything else? And the reality is, not much at the minute, because... The, the Princess of Wales and her health is a huge story. Mm -hmm. I think, and people also were saying yesterday, wasn't there, people saying, well, she, why are you talking about it? She wants privacy. Well, it's not invading privacy to discuss it after she's released. No. Uh, but it's how you do it, I think, which is important. And, you know, the papers today are full of um, first-person stories from um, other celebrities, other writers, um, who've been through the same thing themselves and are just talking about the difficulties that she may face, just in, you know, telling the family yeah. um, and getting through the next few months when everybody is expecting you to get better quickly yeah. um, and the fact that you probably might not. It's a, a very slow process. So there's a lot of talk, I'm afraid, about cancer in the papers today. Now, you could say that's a bit dispiriting, um, but... It is part of uh, modern human life now, I think, isn't it, oh. cancer? Um, and perhaps the more we talk about it, um, the more we'll be able to support each other. Yes, and I think that's a positive thing. And, of course... And that's the... what she wanted. Well, it is what she wanted. And also, what this has done, talking about it, and let's be honest, you pick up the phone to a relative and say, have you heard? Have you heard the news? Mm. So everyone's talking about it. And what it has led to is a huge outpouring of support um, over the last 24 hours, and Kensington Palace have said that the Prince and Princess of Wales are enormously touched by the kind messages they've received following Catherine's diagnosis. In fact, the statement from the palace follows the unprecedented video message which was released on Friday evening, where the princess revealed that she was undergoing what she called preventative chemotherapy after tests done following her surgery in January showed that there had been cancer present. Uh, well, let's talk to former royal butler Grant Harold, who joins us this morning. Good to see you this morning. I mean, this is a, as we've been saying all weekend, it's um, an unprecedented move the way we were told about uh, this cancer diagnosis. But the outpouring of support has been remarkable, hasn't it? Mm, it has. Good morning, Anne. Good morning, Stephen. Um, absolutely. I mean, it's obviously a big thing for her to actually talk about this. I mean, as you, we, we all know somebody or we've got loved ones or even ourselves that all, you know, have this disease or similar diseases. And it's difficult enough talking, isn't it, to loved ones about it. And this is where she's not only having to tell her family, she's telling the, the country, the world. And it is a big step because the one thing I remember working for them or for her was it her privacy is everything to her, you know, it's, it, for both of them, it's really important. And they've managed to get a really good balance between their private and their public, I feel, between private and public life. But this is obviously something that would have, it would, of course, you know, it would have absolutely devastated the family so soon after the King's diagnosis. But what's really interesting is the fact that the King has spoken openly and now she's done the same. This is, this is very unusual because historically, royals did not discuss health issues. As we know with the late Queen and the late Prince Philip, this was a no-go area. And here we've got a very modern royal family where they're actually openly talking about this, which is great because it's raising, it's not, I could say raising awareness, it's getting people talking about it, probably hopefully, hopefully getting people to go and get themselves checked. And I think it's really important what she's done, uh, speaking about it. And I, I really admire it. And at the same time, I think, I think everybody I spoke to is very emotional. I can't tell you how many people would come up to me just 
almost busting into tears that you know it's, it's not the fact of what, the, the fact that she's suffering from it because so many millions do the fact that you know she's got this young family she's you know trying to carry on and you know it's it's amazing absolutely amazing what she's um the way yeah. she's dealt with it i think can I just ask you, I mean, obviously, having been a royal butler in royal households, you would know, but very clearly, we got the impression from King Charles's um, statement that he has received some of these ordinary letters and cards from members mm. of the public, and it's yes. really, yes. really impressed upon him. And by the sound of mm. it, Catherine and William have as well. So, I mean, you as a butler, I mean, do, how... I presume that, that they get so much post, but somebody would go through it and give them a handful, would they? Absolutely. I mean, and I, I remember all, all too well the, you know, when there was an occasion, all the, based up at Hydro, all the cards and the letters and things that would come in. And when I say there's a lot, there is a lot. And it's quite impossible for them to physically go through every single one. But they've got an amazing team. They've got communications departments. And what they do is they go through them. And it is randomly. They will pick a selection. Sometimes there might be something, one of those letters or one of those cards or something that, that straight, it draws something to them. They think that has to be seen. The others, it's very much just, it is a luck of the draw. You know, and they get put in. But they do get passed on. They do see them. A lot of these letters they do see. And... And I, I think it, it definitely helps. I think anybody, again, that's going through something and getting letters and cards and things, it, 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 it just means so much We you know people care. But this, is, this isn't this is just, I think for, for us, when we get cards or letters, it's normally from people that we know or loved ones. This, there'll be, I want to say hundreds of thousands, if not more, letters and cards coming in from across the world of people that she'll probably never even meet. Uh, but yet they're taking the time to write to her and, and to say to, to her and the family, we we're here to support you, and we and you can do this. You know, so many, thankfully, so many other millions of people, as you know, Anne, get, get through this, and and this is what's fantastic. Is that I believe she will, but but these letters will will definitely give her encouragement. Yeah, it's really it's positive. Nice to, it's nice to know, I think, yeah. as well, for everybody watching at the moment who feels uh, that they would love yeah. to get in touch. It is actually worth writing if you want to. Mm. Oh, to absolutely. And I say that to people all the time. Don't think your letters... The chances are the letter will be seen. So definitely put those letters in, you know, because the chances are they will be seen, and it does make a difference. I, I've seen when they read letters, and I know how, um, how happy they are reading some letters but when I was there that they would receive from yeah, members of the public, people they don't even know. OK. Grant Harold, good to see you this morning. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. And if you're watching at the moment, uh, have you ever written to a royal? Have you ever heard a response? I've Love never written. No, I, but, uh, do you know, Make last night I thought it so. would be nice to. Did you? Yeah, yeah. Did I, you do one? No, I haven't done yet. But I was thinking last night... You know, mm -hmm. it will probably never get through. I mean, there's a lovely story in, in the papers today oh, about the fact story. that... Um, well, there are many, actually. But, but the King, obviously, and um, Princess Catherine were in the London Clinic at the same time. And that's where I was treated, funnily enough, so I know those corridors and those rooms and everything. Uh, but apparently, um, what, uh, on several occasions, the King just put on his dressing gown and, and the word was toddle. Somebody said he toddled down the corridor to go and have lunch with See, Catherine. that's nice. I think that's they lovely. They do seem to get it. I was quite touched that he referred to her as his beloved daughter-in-law. Yes, law, yeah, they're very close which, um, look of it. I thought it was very nice. Mm. Very but nice. if you've ever written to a royal, tell us why. Uh, who was it you wrote to? And did you get a response in any way? Yeah, maybe just knowing it was there and seen and is enough, yeah. these sort of things. Anyway, do let us know. GBviews at GBnews. Dot com. And now to much more serious news. Well, it's certainly very serious news. Um, and that's in Russia, uh, because a national day of mourning is taking place following that absolutely brutal and devastating massacre at a concert hall near Moscow um, on Friday. And it killed, we know now, at least 133 people. Well, despite the Islamist group Islamic State claiming responsibility for the attack, President Putin has suggested the attackers were helped by Ukraine. Here's what he said overnight. All the executors, planners and those who ordered this crime will be rightfully and inevitably punished, whoever they are and whoever directed them. Let me repeat, we will identify and punish everyone who stood behind the terrorists who prepared this attack against Russia, against our people. Well, with us in the studio now, defence editor at The Evening Standard, Robert Fox. This is fascinating, isn't it? Because um, um, Islamic State, as it were, have claimed responsibility. Quite quickly. 
But um, President Putin clearly thinks or is seizing the opportunity to blame Ukraine as well. There are two strands, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, in this story now. One is the massacre itself, which was terrible, and the number seems to have gone up to 143 mm. now, with hundreds injured, unspecified numbers. They're probably in a number of, of hospitals. But the other is the false flag argument. This is a political story now which is gathering potency, and it is very important. ISK, as it's called, the Islamic State Khorasan, the parts of Afghanistan whence it comes, where it is fighting the Taliban, would you believe it, has form. It's done a lot of things. But also Putin Russia has form with false flag arguments. And a lot of the Russians in exile, the experts have been going through quite a, a lot of their comments just this morning, again, are pointing to the precedence of false flag arguments. And there was one spectacular one in 1999 where um, apartment blocks were blown up in Moscow as Putin himself was moving, follow me, from being prime minister to president for the first time. He's just been re-elected for the fifth time mm. to the headship of government and, 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 and state. He did briefly become prime minister in between. At that time, he launched the second terrible Chechen war. So this was fingered very clearly. It's very interesting for us here in Britain and us here in London by Alexander Litvinenko, uh -huh. who was then killed three years later. So this, what I'm saying is that Putin's argument, which you illustrated here, shows the psychological campaign he is going through now. What he's saying to people in Russia, in Moscow in particular, is, I'm still in charge, I'm a big boss, the enemies are all around, my war is mm. right. Mm. And it's not the war where he is in trouble, by the way, on the Caucasus borders of, of Russia with Islamic fundamentalists who have attacked in Russia and in Iran the new Russian ally. And you can see how complex it's going. Oh. I'm afraid in the psychological war, we're just at the beginning of it. Is, is this a sense, then, that, <clears throat> that it's, it's better from his, from his perspective to say, we effectively have one enemy, this is being either driven, orchestrated or supported by Ukraine, rather than saying, I'm being attacked from multiple sides? He wouldn't say that. You're absolutely right, Stephen. What he is saying, your security is safe in my mm. hands, except... Why didn't the GRU, the FSB, the Secret Services react sooner? Even the emergency services took nearly two hours to arrive in strength uh, at, at, at the scene. But his message is, I'm the boss, I'm going to make it work for me. I was just watching his body language. It was rather different from the pantomime coup, you may remember, of Prigozhin and uh, the, the Wagner group, where he did look for a moment, genuinely panicked. He didn't look panicked. And one looked as if the, the old uh, pantomime czar, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the boss man, I'm the monarch in charge. This was being played uh, at this time, Declaration of National Mourning, and this will, be, this will be milked. It goes out on state TV, most will believe it. Yes. Yeah. But what, uh, what I don't quite get is that if um, you hypothesise that it could have been a, a false flag operation, who instigated it? Whose fault was it? Islamic State? Islamic State encouraged by the Russian government? Um, would Ukraine have had anything to do with it? Didn't even Western intelligence warn them that something was about to happen? I don't want to be Weasley, but I do have a thoroughly Weasley mind, because that's why I look into mm. these things. I think it was a bit of both. I think they knew that something was, was going on. Let's use it, possibly. I'm not saying that's for sure, because I'd you lose, use absolutely the right word. I don't say on GB News, le mot juste, but mm. the right word. This is hypothesizing. Yes, something was going on because it's so peculiar. The Americans knew that uh, uh, ISIL, uh, uh, Islamic State, was up to something. And by the way, they did a big bomb. Uh, in Iran, you may remember, at the beginning of the year in January, uh, which took everybody by surprise. That came out on the 9th of March. Only three days ago, 
that was responded to by Moscow, by the Kremlin, by, by Putin land, in saying, oh, that was panic and subversion being caused by the Americans. So what really was going on? I'm afraid to say it's not time will tell. We, we may never really know, unless there is a Litvinenko who says this is how the wheels of deliberation... But it is very dark, a lot of this, very right. Machiavellian. Mm. Can I point out a thing that nobody has pointed out in this? No suicide attackers. No, they've caught them all and they're uh, alive. Uh, yeah, they? and it, it, part of the MO, the way they operated with, uh, as we all know, the extreme ends of IS, is that it's absolutely, this is how I go to paradise, you know, mm. that I become a martyr and I do that. So there is something, I think we're right in concluding that, very strange about this and we're not getting the full picture. OK. I mean, it Robert, was for now. Unbelievably Sorry. brutal incident. Yes. And for the gunmen to all have survived, apparently, mm. um, is extraordinary and very unusual. Mm. Oh, well, as Robert says, it's one of those. I think Robert's right. We'll probably never know exactly what's gone on with that one. Um, but, Robert, thanks very much indeed. Let's have a look at some of the other stories heading into the newsroom at 6.16. Well, the United Nations chief, Antonio Guterres, has renewed calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza as he visited the Egyptian side of the Rafah crossing. Uh, Mr Guterres called on Israel to give total, unfettered access to humanitarian goods throughout Gaza. Earlier this week, a UN-backed food security assessment this week said that uh, 1.1 million people in Gaza were struggling with catastrophic hunger and starvation. Ukraine's working to restore power supplies after the biggest Russian attack on its power grid. It killed at least five people and put Europe's biggest nuclear station at risk. President Zelensky is calling for urgent international assistance, saying that Russian terrorism is only possible because Ukraine lacks modern air defence systems. And the knife crime campaigner Richard Taylor has died at the age of 75 after a long battle with cancer. His 10-year-old son, Damilola, was killed in 2000 in what became one of Britain's highest profile crimes. And the loss led Richard and his late wife, Gloria, to set up a trust aimed at supporting disadvantaged young people. He said his son's death was the result of enormous problems in society, but he wanted his legacy to be one of hope. Now, if all the talk of the dark arts with Robert wasn't enough for you, espionage fears have now taken over Westminster as a small group of MPs have been summoned over fears of a new wave of state-backed interference. The Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden, is expected to tell Parliament tomorrow that Beijing is behind a string of recent cyber attacks on MPs and peers. Well, amongst those being summoned, but I don't know if they've been the targets of this or not, uh, Sir Ian Duncan Smith, uh, former Tory Minister Tim Loughton, crossbencher Peer Lord Alton, and SNP MP Stuart MacDonald. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Mm. Joining us now, political commentator Peter Spencer. Morning, Peter. I mean, this just gets weirder and weirder, doesn't it? Um, what's going on? Do you know? <laughs> Do you know? Uh, well, this story most certainly does segue very neatly to the interview you've just done with my old chum, Bob Fox, because of the fact that the Chinese are pretty cosy with the Russians, who are, let's face it now, a pariah state with a capital P. Now, the head of MI5, not last year, I think it was, said, look, the Chinese Communist Party poses a, a game-changing threat to Britain. And uh, when we talk about cyber attacks, most certainly, you're right, Anne, it's, it's, it's invisible and invidious. And it's OK to... Uh, I mean, well, it's actually not OK. It's bad enough when someone slings a brick through, through the window of, of an MP's office. But a cyber attack is something you can't get a handle on at all. All. And remember that, that it's very, very powerful technology. It can be used to bring down aeroplanes 
or close down banks. And so the suggestion that we have now is that there is going to be a briefing for MPs tomorrow. And indeed, there is also the suggestion that the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, will hold a meeting, a private meeting with the backbench Tory MPs committee, the 1922 committee. And uh, it's all a bit awkward for him in lots of ways, because when he was prime minister, he said, look, we have a golden era of relations with Beijing. Well, I have to say he has to concede very, very fulsomely that that golden era is well and truly over. Um, what do we know about these four being summoned to a meeting? Are they likely to have been apparent victims of this or, or, or what? what? Why these particular four? Well, they're described as China hawks. By that, they mean, by, by that is meant that they are people who have been particularly outspoken in warning of the strategic risks posed by the Chinese. And so, therefore, the suggestion is, and of course, this is this is an exclusive in the Sunday Times. It hasn't been possible as yet to um, verify this story. But the suggestion is that they have been targeted by the Chinese security services, and therefore they are at risk, and therefore they need to be told PDQ to um, up their own personal security. I mean, this isn't the first time we've heard about um, cybersecurity, particularly in relation to China hacks. What are we doing giving foreign aid to China still? That's a very good question, Anne. I mean, I mean, of course, I mean, because the Chinese do represent a fifth of the world population, and we do have to cooperate them with with them in all manner of ways, like, for example, fighting climate change. And therefore, we can't simply say, right, we don't talk to you anymore. You smell, you're stinky. You can't come to my party. You you have to have dealings with them. But uh, how far you take this? As I say, I come back to it, and David Cameron, as Prime Minister, said, look, we want to cosy up them, and there's now a recognition we need to keep them. You know, if, you, if you're going to suck with the devil, you do it with a very long spoon, but you're still going to suck with it. Mm. OK, Peter, thanks very much indeed. I'll tell you what I find very extraordinary about all of this. It swings and roundabouts. I've said before, I'm currently rereading all of the Tom Clancy's. Oh, yes. I love all the Tom. I, and I it's like all this. espionage. Well, so. Yeah. This could be a Tom Clancy yeah. plot. And it's honestly, because I go to bed listening to it all on audiobook, actually. Um, and I, I, I'm starting to confuse reality with fiction because it's so similar. Well, you get the feeling the that plot. if you wrote the news at the moment as a fiction novel, people wouldn't believe it. They'd say you're taking it too far. Yeah. And the sheer fact that we still give foreign aid to China, apparently the amount we give is falling rapidly. But in... 2021 to 22, um, we gave them mm, 48 million. Yeah. Um, well, that's which I know is, is I mean, in, in world terms, it's not a huge amount. Um, that's down from 82 million the year before, and apparently it is still declining. But I think a lot of people would be shocked to find that we're giving China any sort of foreign aid. Well, it's a whole, it raises the foreign aid question, doesn't it? And if we are still going to give foreign aid, and personally, I think we should where it's really needed, but you've got to target it more carefully. Yes. We can't be giving foreign aid to China. We can't be giving foreign aid to India. We need to be giving it Both to Both countries of, of which have, have their own space programme, program, for instance, yes. So we need to be targeting that foreign aid at places that really need it. And then hopefully as a result... And maybe not giving foreign aid to countries that are targeting us in different ways. Well, I suppose you're not giving it to the government, are you? You're giving it you're to You're funding those... a, a particular educational scholarships and things yeah. like that, apparently. Yeah, you're not, just, you're not just giving it to the Politburo. Well, one hopes not. No. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, nearly not. anything is possible nowadays. All right, mm. let's uh, get a check on the weather for you this mor morning with Marco Patania. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Sunday promises to be a much quieter day weather-wise across the UK than on Saturday, drier, brighter and less blustery too. 
There are still one or two showers around today, particularly toward the north of Scotland. Uh, still wintry across the hilltops there, but elsewhere the winds, as I say, are much lighter, more in the way of sunshine around. Any showers very isolated, and with that extra bit of sunshine and the winds being that much lighter too, it should feel a bit warmer than on Saturday. Temperatures peaking in the south and southeast at around about 12 or 13 Celsius. 13 there in London is 55 in Fahrenheit, nearer average towards the north at 8 to 11 Celsius. As we go through the evening, we'll start to see some outbreaks of rain working their way in from the west, pushing in across parts of Northern Ireland and other westernmost areas. Whereas uh, towards the north and east, as we go through Sunday night, we'll hold on to some clearer conditions. Here it will turn quite chilly, at least for a time, because of a touch of frost here. Whereas out towards the west, that cloud, wind and rain will start to lift temperatures. And by the morning on Monday, temperatures uh, in Belfast, for example, will be around 6 Celsius, 43 in Fahrenheit. That sets the scene for a bit of an east-west split in our weather on Monday. Wet at times, fairly blustery conditions developing out towards the west. Some quite heavy bursts of rain at times. We do hold on to sunnier skies towards the north and east with some cloud gradually pushing in there as we go through the day from the west. But in the best of that sunshine and with the wind staying fairly light out towards the east, temperatures will climb into double figures. But feeling cooler with that wind and rain out towards the west. That's it. See you soon. Bye bye. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Yeah, it was very chilly again this morning if you're mm. looking out the window and wondering whether to get up. Don't. Oh, don't. No, no, really don't. It's, it's like five degrees out there at the minute. It's not where, where I was, I don't know whether uh, we got, I think what you call a hunter's moon. Where there's oh, with a sort of scudding yeah, clouds yeah. and and a big moon, almost a full moon. I think they call that Hunter's Moon for some reason. Looked absolutely spectacular, mm. but very cold. Too cold to put the cat out this morning. Is that? It was really. He had a look. And, what, didn't, and like didn't like it. No, no. not going. So, so I don't what blame does he do? Him. He just holds on, does he? Must do. Yeah, I presume. Yeah. My well, little, I mean, I hope so. My little dog sticks her head out through the cat flap and has a look and sees the weather, and very often retreats as well yeah. for the same reason. Yeah, the dog went out, but then he's in, he's in and out, yeah. so that's fine. But the cat wasn't having anything no, this morning. No, I don't uh, Right, now, do you want to get your hands on a bit of money this morning? Well, don't miss out on your chance to win our great British... We're calling it spring, which will come in the end, I suppose. The great British spring giveaway. Uh, you can get tech and treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash. It's an amazing prize. It could be yours. Here's how. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax free cash. Text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at GBNews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Garden pizzas in the summer must be quite nice as a change from well, barbecue. Lovely. Everyone, do you get fed up with barbecue? Well, that's not fed up, but you know, it's always the same sort of thing, isn't it? If you say, oh, pop round, we're doing pizzas. No, I think the idea of an outdoor pizza oven is really nice. Really I know you're really, <laughs> you're nearly there, aren't I'm you? I'm nearly there. I'm nearly putting my hand in my pocket for one. We shall see. I'd enter the competition, but we're not allowed. No. So there you go, so I'm not going to win one. Um, anyway, don't go anywhere. Adrian McGee's got your sport in just a couple of minutes. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Lots of you have written to royals yeah, and have and responses, had which is lovely. Elizabeth from Uxbridge says, uh, like so many of us, I was moved by the loss of Her Majesty the Queen, so I sent a, I sent a card of condolence to King Charles. I received a lovely card back, which contained printed within a photo of the king as a little boy playing with his mother. I treasure that card. Isn't I bet that you lovely? Did. Yeah. Wow. Catherine says, um, I wrote to a royal. I sent a letter to Lady Susan Hussey. Do you remember? She was um, one of the Queen's major ladies in waiting, wasn't she? Oh. Um, and, she uh, when, and she was in sort of controversy just recently. She replied with such a kind response. She has beautiful handwriting. Her reply touched me deeply. I will keep that letter and I will be sending cards to the king and Catherine. Um, Jack says, I wrote to King Charles, and he did write back, but the bottom was crushed in our post and was illegible. Oh. Oh, that's a bit heartbreaking. But he says, but he did write back. I'm an artist and enjoy his watercolours. That's lovely. So you've got a it's nice to know, isn't it? Diane says, um, I received a lovely card from King Charles, signed by him, thanking me for my get well card and good wishes. This week I received a letter of thanks from Kensington Palace after I sent some books for the children, George, Charlotte and Louis. The books were written by my sister and proceeds for families of Ukraine and an orphanage in Poland. And I've received letters from Queen Elizabeth and Queen Camilla in the past. Oh, you're quite so it's, a writer. It's worth writing to them. It is. Well, it's nothing else. You know they're, they're getting them. You know they're reading mm. them. And as we've heard from uh, the Prince and Princess of Wales this morning, you know they're appreciated. Mm. And the King said that particularly. Oh, the King, too, yes, there were some lovely... He was um, actually holding some and he said, your cards your, and letters mean so much. Some of them were a bit cheeky as well. I can't remember what it was. He was pictured on the front of some of the papers holding a card yeah. that, was, that was a bit sort of cheeky, but it, he was smiling at it. Maybe if it's more unusual, it gets through. I think he's probably got quite a wicked sense of humour, oh, like his father. So, yeah. Really. But anyway, so if you're going to write... Write with confidence. I think they're lovely. Keep your stories coming through this morning. GB Views at gbnews.com, you know how. Now, hundreds of community pharmacies have closed in the last five years, adding more pressure on overstretched GPs. That's according to experts. Well, the Association of Independent Multiple Pharmacies has warned that we could see a tsunami of further pharmacy closures across the country because of pressures on the system. Our national reporter, Theo Chikomba, reports. Getting the medication and advice you need could get harder. More than 400 pharmacies have shut across the UK in the last five years and more are set to close. Yeah, is it a prescription? Yeah, it's a, it's a prescription. This comes as pharmacists are being asked to do more to help take pressure off GPs and support patients like Zara. I mean, just right now, I just got some medical advice about like, a little patch on my lip. Um, and that's something if I try to get advice from the doctors, you kind of have to wait two weeks for that because it's not that urgent. Um, but also, I mean, that was great advice. Now I know I don't need to panic about it. It's not infectious. And 
she's already told me what I need to do and try and if it doesn't get better, come back again. She's not the only one as others here in St Albans have been unable to get a GP appointment quickly enough. It has happened. I think it was um, some dry skin issue. <laughs> yes. And I was able to get advice uh, which helped from the pharmacy. And that was after attempting to go to the GP? Yes, it was. Pharmacists are an essential part of the community, just like optometrists, of which I was one, and GPs, another. And more and more work is now handed over to pharmacists doing GPs work, I know that. And that's why those in the industry are demanding action, as they say closures of pharmacies is adding hundreds of thousands of unnecessary GP appointments. Pharmacies up and down the country argue that while the government is putting in just over two and a half billion pounds into the sector every year, it's not in line with inflation. And they argue that we may see even more pharmacies have to close their doors. To survive, some are having to borrow to stay afloat as energy and medical bills have increased. Dr Leila Handbeck says her industry is broke to their knees due to years of underfunding. We've estimated that so far since 2015 over 1,000 pharmacies have permanently closed their doors and uh, more will be doing so this year. So it's, um, you know, something needs to be done about this, otherwise we're going to be seeing, you know, pharmacy deserts as, as we're seeing dental deserts. The Department for Health and Social Care told us £645 million of new funding is available to support the expansion of pharmacies and that four in five people have access to one within a 20-minute walk from home. But in the most deprived areas, the concern is for how long? Theo Chikomba, GB News. It's all to do with it. It's the contracts. I yeah. actually did a, I actually did um, uh, a podcast during COVID for uh, that pharmacy association, oddly enough. Um, and we interviewed loads of MPs and all sorts of stuff on this podcast. But it is all down to the contracts. They're doing so much work, but the government funding just isn't there. Even That's the though... same as dentists, just as that lady said. Yeah. It's down to the contracts. A lot of dentists would like to do some NHS work, but th there is no room on the, on the list for them. They just can't get the money. Area. Of course, they have to then pay their own rents and all the rest of it. Yeah. And the staff costs are going up and all the rest of it. So you just can't afford to do it. But they are a lifeline for communities. And the more they can do... So that yes, because we were, we were being told that we would be able to lean on them more. And, yeah, yeah, you should be able to. And they want to do more. And they're so well trained. They're so highly trained. Mm, they're very highly trained. We, I mean, in, in the village where I live, we would be completely lost without our pharmacist. Mm. Absolutely lost. So, um, but what do you do? It's all about, as always, all about the money with this one. Uh, keep your thoughts coming through on that one, actually. If you are a pharmacist, it'd be great to hear from you this mm. morning. In the meantime, let's see what's happening in the sport. Ada McGee is here with bad news from Wembley last night. It was bad news. We were talking about the flag on the back of the collar, but that just dissipates in a puff of smoke, as predicted last night. There were some George Crosses held up in the crowd, as we mentioned earlier on, mm. and didn't we? But once the football got underway, you know what, when, when there are absentees, we talked about Harry Kane not being around because of his ankle injury, Bukai Saka not being around. The Arsenal player has been so impressive for club and country over the last two or three years. That's when the stand-ins, the ones who are knocking on the door, the ones that the media are clamouring to get into the squad, that's when they have to perform and sadly, Ollie Watkins fluffed his lines last night. He had a big, big chance in the first half at Wembley against Brazil. He could have written his name in lights. He could have probably got even, even got a start against Belgium on Tuesday. He could have etched his name onto the list for the plane to, to Germany, but he just missed and he hit the ball over the bar. There were other players as well who didn't particularly impress on their big nights. Lewis Dunk came off the bench, didn't look particularly impressive. Harry Maguire, yes, he's, 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 a, he's a regular and he's been doing very well for Manchester United, but he looked shaky, which was worrying because he's somebody who's going to be a mainstay of the squad over the next, well, he has been over the last few years and will be. Again, Ben Chilwell down the left-hand side, the Chelsea fullback, not good either. And so, yes, it wasn't a fantastic game. I mean, it was a 17-year-old who scored the winning goal, Endrick. So a bit of a tonic for him. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Very good. Yeah. Very, very, but 17, and he's 17, the incredible. Goal. Yeah, he's already got to move to Madrid, Real Madrid, lined up in the summer. Wow. So that's how close are these clubs. They get younger and younger. Don't I know, they? I know. They're going to be. No, we, we just get older and older. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> they're going to be nappy. They're going to be nappy soon, aren't they? Yeah. Are they? So, so Gareth Southgate said afterwards he was 
disappointed with the result, obviously, but he saw plenty of positives. I didn't see that many pos positives in that side, to be honest with you, in that, in that team. And I think that crowd will have largely gone home disappointed. Oh, yeah, yeah, you would think so. Mm. Can we talk about Sven Joran Eriksson? Yeah, lovely story, this. So when he announced uh, a month or so ago, or six, seven weeks ago, that he was dying from cancer and only has a few months uh, to live, or less than a year, uh, he revealed, and he wasn't able to reveal this during his career, that he was a Liverpool fan. His father was a Liverpool fan. He went to watch them training at the end of the 70s and got, got some uh, ideas from all those great players and all those great managers who invited him there right at the start of his managerial career. So it's always been a dream of his to sort of manage Liverpool. Yes. And so... yeah, actually, I mean, he already got the job, the big, far bigger job than that, didn't he? Yeah, he himself? did, actually. Yeah, don't tell Liverpool fans that. No, right, you okay. do. But, um, but the Liverpool have a, a Legends game every year, this time of year, during the international uh, break, and they invited... Sven Joran Eriksson to manage the team, lead them out. So it was a hell of a hell of a cast list. I mean, John Aldridge, jo Ian Rush, John Barnes, Stephen Gerrard, F uh, Fernando Torres. He got a standing ovation before the game. They're saying you'll never walk alone for him, oh. and he was hugely emotional. Mm. Oh, you would be. I know. Oh, yeah. You would be. I know. And uh, they beat. Especially Ice if you've been a lifelong fan and you've always kept it quiet. Oh yeah, exactly. You had, yeah. And you've had to as well. Mm. Yeah, you had to. I mean, you can't be England manager and say you're a Liverpool fan. No, no, you the, absolutely not. Man United will start saying, mm. "Well, why aren't you picking our players?" So, but, but when you say he managed that the, the yes. Legends team. Did he do any managing or did yeah, he just yeah, he leave said, Well, out? Stephen Gerrard said afterwards he hasn't lost his touch, so he oh. obviously arranged some tactics. I and mean, when one of the two of the players have seen better days, I have to say, I mean, to be fair, on uh, John Aldridge, and Rush, John Barnes, I mean, they haven't played for over 30 years, some of them, so yeah, <laughs> they're a little bit out of shape. But it was good, though. But, yeah, but there were some, some of the younger ones are still, like Stephen Gerrard didn't retire mm. that long ago, Fernando Torres, they'd have been in decent shape. And they won 4-2 against, uh, against Ajax, and he saw some really great names, and the money goes to the LFC Foundation as well, which uh, helps That's with really uh, tackle good. youth unemployment and social issues in the city. Yeah, really good. What's going on with the Australian? Australian Grand Prix it's just well finished not that long ago. Yeah, we got a story. We got a story which is incredible. Max Verstappen was uh, didn't complete the race. He was he was crashed off for really? the first time He's not in done that for years. In, no, I know he hasn't. Yeah, I mean he last year I think he won 21 out of 22 races. That's why it's become so boring, and that's why that's why the story a couple of weeks ago about Christian Horner gained, gained such traction because there's nothing happening in the F1. But that wasn't the only thing that uh, that went on. I mean Lewis Hamilton crashed out at uh, lap 17, an engine failure. Verstappen incidentally was a fire in his engine. And so uh, there were no casualties, thankfully. It was yeah. put out at the side of the, uh, of the track. Uh, Carlos Sainz, uh, and a, it was a Ferrari 1-2 with uh, Leclerc. It is a bit tricky sometimes going to Australia. It's a little bit of a different course. Historically, some of the big sides of uh, big teams have struggled down there. But we saw a finish on that this morning. And who knows? I mean, it might be the only race that Verstappen loses all season. But, uh, but at least <laughs> at the beginning, we looked like we might have, might have a beginning of a story. And, of course, Lewis Hamilton next, uh, next season uh, moves on as well. So Yeah, where's he going? He's going to Ferrari. Oh, right, yeah. And Andy Murray has reached the third round of the <coughs> Miami Open. Yes, he has, against Thomas Martin Echeverria, a highly fancied Argentinian, who actually beat him in the Australian Open back in uh, January. Don't forget, the preparations for the French is coming... Uh, is, is soon going to be uh, uh, upon us. The Miami Open is one that's very, very favourable to Murray. He's done well there in, in the past. He won 7-6, 6-3. And you know what? He's 37 in May. He just will not give up. On this dream. No, and Djokovic they? isn't in it. No, that's isn't right. It? No, he pulled out. Yeah, well, so, he's managing his he's managing his schedule. So Andy yeah. could, you know, could push forward. And... Yeah, he, he could. I mean, there are still some de some big hitters uh, left in it. Daniel Medvedev, the holder, is still in the in the tournament. But that's a that's a, a decent uh, outside of the Grand Slams. That's one of the one of the bigger ones. Yeah. As I say, he's done there. Well, done well there before. And I wonder what keeps him going. Because, I mean, he's done everything. He's won three Grand Slams. He's won Olympic gold. He doesn't know how to stop, does he? I mean, no. no. Presumably, if you've always been that much driven, and yeah. he is a very driven soul, isn't he? Absolutely, How yeah, do you yeah. know how to... You don't know how to well, stop? Well, he had a long time... I, th I think with that, that, all those times struggling with injury, it made him value what, uh, what he's got. Not that, he, not that he, he was ever not of that persuasion, of course, but... I think that ask any sports person, and they'll tell you you're a long time retired. And say mm. keep it going as long mm, as you possibly can. Oh. He's only he's only 37 in May, so we don't, might, it might be old in sports terms, but it's not old for the rest of us, is it? Long no, time no. retired. Nothing wrong with that, is no, it? No. <laughs> I'd love oh, that. Lovely. <laughs> Smashing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Aiton, thank you very Smashing much it. indeed. That's something else I'd love to hear from you at home. Is what's up? If, have you plan? Did you plan your retirement? Are you retired? And is it what you thought it would be? Oh. You know, are you doing something you've always dreamed of doing? I, 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 mm. just, I just fancy retiring and pottering. Pottering sounds I lovely. I love pottering. I want to be able to get and travel a bit more and things. Yeah. But I've got my retirement plans. It's all, it's all set out in the book. Really? All set out. I know exactly how much money I should... Well, you know, stock markets and all the rest of it, pensions are all... Woo. But really? I should be able to retire at 60. All worked out. It's all worked out. And what out. are you going to do with that time? 
Well, I don't quite know. No, you haven't got that worked out. Well, not quite, because my you husband... You just sit in your couch and My husband will not money. have retired at that point. No, no. So we shall see. Mm. He could have an early retirement eventually, and then we'll just go and do a little travel. Travel and swan about and be in... You do some writing, won't you? Oh, yeah, sounds writing. lovely. Yeah, for about new travels and pay the bills. No, I might no. make the odd okay. special Plenty appearance. <laughs> <laughs> no, writing's too much like hard work, but come here and waffle it on is. for a bit. Might get get in touch. GBviews at gbnews.com. Tell us what you're doing in retirement. Love to know. Oh. Have you got some tips for him? <laughs> oh, for who? Oh, for, oh, for, oh, for, I thought you meant for Andy Murray. Well, <laughs> either or, or, you know, we'll pass yeah, the letter on. Either or. <laughs> um, all right, uh, we're heading to a break. We're going to be back with all the papers in just a moment. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. Can you just let us know if, if there have been people getting into contact with you as a local councillor about how they feel about every lamppost, which is supposed to be public, mm. neutral territory, being covered in these flags? Has it made some of your constituents nervous to walk the streets? It's a complete range of people, including people who are from the Bangladeshi Muslim community who support who support the um, endeavours of what's going of, of Gaza, of what is going on, and are hostile to the actions of the Israeli government, but feel that they shouldn't have these flags on streets. So if you walk down some of the streets, it doesn't look like a London borough. It looks almost like what you would imagine in Ceausescu's Romania, with flags on every street. Well, well, Peter, can you let us know? Uh, what it's like in the council and their activities in Tower Hamlets. How much time, for example, has been spent discussing issues relating to what's happening in the Middle East? Has it dominated quite a lot of time? No. Um, let's be absolutely fair to the mayor and the administration. There's a heck of a lot to do in this council. We have extremes of deprivation and, um, of course, wealth because of the Clary Wilson city fringe. We have huge problems on the council. And to be fair, the council spends its time doing council matters. And they said initially, in fact, absolutely carefully at council meetings, we can't interfere with foreign policy, but we've got a lot to do on national policy and local policy. Let's concentrate on that. So there hasn't been too much pressure that you can see from people living in the borough for the council to take a stance? Members of the council and the administration have... have um, put their support. As I've said, we're talking of free speech. They're entitled to do that, but it's what happens where the council is responding to absolutely everybody, all 320,000 people who live in our borough. Six forty-seven. Good morning. Let's have a look at the newspapers for you today. The Sunday Times has uh, the Princess of Wales uh, writing every word of her video message herself without any input from her advisers, and it felt like that. Actually. Yeah, it did actually. Very personal. The Mail on Sunday leads with uh, Princess Catherine as well, revealing that she feels extremely moved by the overwhelming love and sympathy she's received following that announcement. Sunday Express has the Princess of Wales astounding those close to her with the courage and dignity she displayed. The Sun on Sunday leads with Princess Catherine again, having a heart-to-heart -heart with the King at Windsor Castle hours before she announced her cancer diagnosis. It'll bring the two even closer together, I mm. should think, won't mm. it? Uh, and the only paper not leading with the Princess of Wales is The Observer which has French police funded by the UK government endangering the lives of vulnerable migrants by using deadly tactics to intercept small boats in the Channel. Well, joining us to go through what's making the news is Deputy Editor at Spiked, Fraser Myers, and Editor-at-Large at Times Mon Money Mentor, jo Georgie Frost. Lovely to see you both. Good morning. And, of course, it is Catherine again. Yes. Um, uh, and if we look, Fraser, at the Sunday Times front page, this is the fact that um, we now hear that she wrote every word of what she said. Yeah, so this is coming from uh, Kate's uh, personal friends. I think what's interesting, not just that she wrote every word, but that she felt it was important to do a video message yeah. um she said she thought that uh, a written message would be too jarring just putting out you know a, a statement that might not um doesn't resonate do, the same wouldn't way. resonate in the same way yeah. and i think also you know the palace really did need to draw a line under this uh, yeah. issue given the intense weeks and months of of speculation about her health and about um, various other aspects of her her life unfortunately um 
So yeah, this uh, and, and it does, you know, it does come across as very personal. It does come across, um, you know, she is someone known for her having great dignity and poise, and you can see that very well in, in this video. Yeah. yeah, and Georgie in the Sunday Express's front page, they go for the fact that she has been so touched by our reaction. Yes, and I can imagine so. I just back to the story that she chose to do this herself. I think is really interesting because it is the palace press office or whoever's her advisors, whoever, has been very heavily criti criticised over the last few months for the way that it feels like Kate has almost had to come out and say something that's deeply personal. My, mom, my mother got cancer when I was in, the te in my teens and I will never forget that moment of seeing her face mm -hmm. and seeing that fear and fear in myself and understanding that. So it's an it incredibly difficult time for a young woman, a young mother of three young children, to go through this and then to go through this so publicly. Mm. So, you know, uh, I, I wish her best, uh, the, all the best. What else can we say? It's a, 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 a slight difference. I'm not trying to diminish what she's going through in any way, shape or form. But by doing this video, I mean, you just know that the support of the nation is going to be behind you. Absolutely. And, look, I mean, I don't know if she felt she had to do this to stop all of the salacious gossip online and all that sort of thing. And if she did feel that way, then I, I think that's awful yeah. that she felt yeah. that way. Mm -hmm. But I would also feel this kind of... Everybody now turning on other people who are speculating the media are terrible. I'd suggest a lot of what we've seen over the last few months really isn't coming from our media. It's coming from outside. Every time I go abroad and I speak to colleagues abroad, they always say to me, oh, you heard the latest. And I'm like, no, we don't know anything. No, but the we are actually quite... It's, it's, it's not... Our, it's, some of it is papers and things. A lot of it's social media. Yeah. Exactly, which comes from... Media. A lot of... Exactly, it's social media. And so there's not, not a lot of what we do. I think the British media in this regard normally quite, res quite respectful yeah. of that. Yeah. I, th I think it's, really, it's unfortunate that nowadays we, we've sort of lost the value of privacy, you know, because we have laws against privacy, but that doesn't seem to have done anything in this, um, in this instance. We seem to think that if people aren't telling us everything, um, you then know, they're, 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 they're hiding, hiding something. something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, rather right than saying you know. there are healthy reasons why someone wouldn't want to reveal very, very intimate details about their illnesses, we think there must be something sinister, uh, something secretive. And, you know, so I think maybe we should use this as an opportunity to rediscover the value of privacy, having a private life, letting people have their own private space. Yes, I don't know, the whole thing just just drives me around. I was just driven by one... I don't know what paper it was in. Oh, here we go. And one particular columnist, who I'm not going to name, uh, but very left-wing and known for it, and he's... A, he's apologised mm. on Twitter, but said, as someone who speculated on this, without considering it could be a serious health condition, I'm very ashamed about what he posted, but without considering it could be a serious health condition. We were told it was a serious yeah, exactly. health Yeah, this is exactly right. I don't, I don't understand this. I mean... Major said, abdominal surgery and she a needs serious time, health condition. She needs time to rest. We yeah. have absolutely no right, absolutely no right to know her medical yeah. issues. No. She, they've absolutely been clear about this. Where I think sort of the, cr the cracks have been allowed to come in is a little bit of information here, mm. a little bit of information there, sort of... You know, if you're going to be sticking to the Queen's attitude of never complain, never explain, then you should really stick to that. Mm. So I think that allowed some creeps to come in, but yeah. Yeah. wish her well. And it's worth, worth stressing that, we, you know, as, as you said, we knew this was a serious illness and we knew that she wouldn't be back um, for, quite, this, a long for time. quite a long time until after Easter. It's not Easter yet. I don't know what people thought why there had needed to be a gap to fill. It was... It was the thing is, I suppose, being nasty. she is so high-profile. She's, mm. she's one, of the, one of the most popular, if not the most popular, member of the royal family at the moment. Um, and then the king, as well, being ill with yeah. the same thing. You were looking at the um, Sun on Sunday oh, front I page. Which is about the fact that they had a very emotional lunch, a heart-to-heart -heart yes. at Windsor Castle before she did this. So this was on Thursday. She actually recorded the announcement on, on Wednesday. Wednesday. Uh, then she met the king for... Um, a lunch on Thursday and then we had the announcement on, on, on Friday. Um, I, there's also some really interesting stories coming out from the, the other papers suggesting that, you know, they were in hospital at the same time and so Charles would come in his uh, nighty and uh, visit in his, in his uh, dressing you know, gown. hospital dressing gown yeah. and visit her at, 
Um, you toddled uh, down the corridor. Toddled, toddled down the corridor. For some reason, they used the word toddle. Mm. Yeah. I tell you what, it, it won't have been a hospital dressing gown. <laughs> no, no. It would have been one brought in, I'll exactly. tell you that. Yes. But I'll tell you what is nice is we, we get all this in a lot... It's not all been driven by the Harry and Meghan thing, but that's exacerbated. This idea that it's a very dysfunctional family and it's all very odd and all this it. This is... This just promotes the fact that... I mean, they clearly have a very good, close, yeah. loving relationship. Mm. Which, uh, which is fantastic. It is. I mean, united in, in their health issues, but they've always had a very close bond. Yes. And, and, and the stories like this are sort of where we'd like to go, I think, with now, rather than all this, yeah. as I said, salacious gossip that we don't want to talk about. You know, let's just focus on mm. Kate having some time and... and Recovering and well, toddling too, down corridors, too, for example. They're two incredibly important people who need to heal. Mm. Um, and you can't speed up healing. No. It takes its time, doesn't it? Definitely. And they're probably going and through all sorts of other medicines the... and treatments mm. and everything as well. Yeah. And focusing on the children, I would also say, mm. is this time of, you know, this is where the privacy really needs to come in, is, you know, mm. this is three children that are processing something they can not possibly understand. And I think hopefully that opens the debate for how we do talk to children and support children who are going through this sort of thing Posi as well. But the positive thing with this is that the, the children are still very young, so they won't understand all the implications no. of this, will they? They'll just know mummy's not They can be well. shielded from a lot yeah. of it, I think. Yeah. Which is... Which I think is a very good thing. Keep, keep them out of the way. Um, lovely. Fraser, Georgie, thank you very much indeed. We'll see you a little bit later on. Um, in the meantime, should we see just how cold and miserable it is? Well, actually, it was, no, it was quite clear yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. But what's it going to be like today? Here's the weather. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Sunday promises to be a much quieter day weather-wise across the UK than on Saturday. Drier, brighter and less blustery too. There are still one or two showers around today, particularly toward the north of Scotland. Uh, still wintry across the hilltops there, but elsewhere the winds, as I say, are much lighter, more in the way of sunshine around, any showers very isolated. And with that extra bit of sunshine and the winds being that much lighter too, it should feel a bit warmer than on Saturday. Temperatures peaking in the south and southeast at around about 12 or 13 Celsius. 13 there in London is 55 in Fahrenheit, nearer average towards the north at 8 to 11 Celsius. As we go through the evening, we'll start to see some outbreaks of rain working their way in from the west, pushing in across parts of Northern Ireland and other westernmost areas. Whereas uh, towards the north and east, as we go through Sunday night, we'll hold on to some clearer conditions. Here it will turn quite chilly, at least for a time, because of a touch of frost here. Whereas out towards the west, that cloud, wind and rain will start to lift temperatures. And by the morning on Monday, temperatures uh, in Belfast, for example, will be around 6 Celsius, 43 in Fahrenheit. That sets the scene for a bit of an east-west split in our weather on Monday. Wet at times, fairly blustery conditions developing out towards the west. Some quite heavy bursts of rain at times. We do hold on to sunnier skies towards the north and east, with some cloud gradually pushing in there as we go through the day from the west. But in the best of that sunshine, and with the wind staying fairly light out towards the east, temperatures will climb into double figures, but feeling cooler with that wind and rain out towards the west. That's it. See you soon. Bye-bye. Looks like things are heating up. Box Spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 45 pounds in tax-free cash text gb win to 84902 text cost two pounds plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to gb03 po box 8690 derby de1 nine double t uk only entrance must be 18 or over lines close at 5 p.m on friday the 29th of march full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand good luck Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
every Sunday from 11. Join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good morning. It is 7 o'clock on Sunday, the 24th of March. Today, Kensington Palace has revealed the Princess of Wales is enormously touched by the outpouring of support following her cancer diagnosis. The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, has declared a day of mourning following the deaths of about 143 people, we understand now, in that Moscow terrorist attack. He's also made unsubstantiated claims that Ukraine was involved. There are claims today that China has been targeting senior politicians at Westminster through a string of cyber attacks as four senior MPs are called to an urgent meeting. And as landmarks around the world switched off their lights for Earth Hour last night, we'll be debating whether it has any impact or is it just virtue signalling. And today marks 80 years since one of the most famous events of the Second World War, the Great Escape made famous by the 1963 movie, of course. We'll be looking at how the anniversary is being marked across the country. It was an opportunity spurned for the England players staking their claim for a place on the plane to Germany for the Euros this summer. As a 17-year-old scored Brazil's late winner, better news, though, in the tennis for Andy Murray. He's into the third round of the Miami Open. More later. Hello, today looks much quieter weather-wise across the UK than on Saturday. There'll be more in the way of sunshine around and lighter winds too. And with those lighter winds, it should feel a bit warmer. I'll have all the details a little bit later. Morning to you, I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Anne Diamond and this is Breakfast on GB News. Well, loads of you have retired or planning to retire. Mm. Sending lovely messages in. Uh, Philip from Chester says, I'm recently retired and I'm loving it. Uh, to start it off with a bang, I'm going to Hawaii in three weeks. Have a wonderful time. Check the weather. Yes, don't put him off. No, I'm not. I'm just saying check it before you go. I just had a... It wasn't very good when I was there. Uh, no. But usually is, apparently. Usually yes. is brilliant. Yes. Um... Rod says, my wife and I have achieved our retirement dream here in Thailand. <laughs> we dare not think how awful life is in the UK nowadays. It's not that bad. It's not that, it's not that but it sounds worse than it is, Rod. But, I'm, you glad, I'm glad you've achieved the dream, though. That must yeah. be lovely living the dream. Uh, Sula says, um, when I retire in about 10 years, I want to pot around the house and garden. Pottering is underrated. It so I agree. is. Yeah, I love a potter. Great. Mind you, it's not all positive news. Matthew from Portsmouth says, like millions of Brits, I can barely afford to pay the bills. So putting money away for retirement is out of the question. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll be looking forward to getting abandoned by the state after a lifetime of paying tax. Oh. I know, it's miserable for some. Jan says, oh. ten years ago, I started to learn to play bridge. I love it, and you never stop learning. Uh, I've met lots of new people and I've made friends who I now go on holiday with. I also recently took up watercolour painting. Oh. I'm 78, I've got three young grandchildren and I love my life. Wonderful. That's so nice to hear. Wonderful. Uh, there's a lot to be said for card games. I'll tell you what, I've, we haven't... Or for taking up hobbies, frankly. We haven't played it at home yet, but... Um... My brother and sister-in-law, we had to play a game with them a few weeks ago. They're into canasta. Is that card? Yes, with cards? yeah, canasta. It's just a card game. Um, you need a canasta set, though. Um, but they got us one, so we need to get that out. And it was brilliant. It was one of those things I'd only ever heard of it in, like, a Poirot... Yeah, that's true, sort of, yes. That it's something very, very old-fashioned. Yeah. Um, it's brilliant. It's really brilliant. Well, You've I... got to engage your brain a bit with it. That's right. I think that's important. You've got to find something to do, so if you... but something that's fun instead of work. <coughs> if you're a canasta player and you want someone to play with, I'm learning. So there you go. OK, well, we're asking you today if, uh, if you've managed to achieve 
a wonderful retirement, the sort of retirement that you always dreamt of. Love to hear what your retirement would be, could be and is. Um, does it live up to what you thought? And also we're asking you if you've written to a royal, because lots of you have. Yes. And it's important at the moment because um, it would appear that both the King and Princess Catherine are getting an awful lot of letters and cards from people and it means something very important to mm. them. Yeah, it does. So keep your thoughts coming through on all of that. Not everyone's had luck, though. Monica's not had any luck. She's written five times and not had a response. I'm very surprised at that, Monica. I am five times, because Linda from Scunthorpe, Morning Linda, says, talking about writing letters to the royal family, I wrote a letter to Margaret Thatcher after the Brighton bombing, and I received a beautiful handwritten letter back. Ooh. She was so appreciative of my letter. I also wrote to Elizabeth Taylor many years ago when she was seriously ill in Sinus Cedar, uh, the Cedar sinai Hospital in LA, and to make sure she got the letter, I sent it in an envelope addressed to her, but but then I put that envelope in a letter to her surgeon and I asked him to pass it on. Oh, sneaky. Very clever. I received a lovely printed card back thanking me for the well wishes, but she had signed it herself. Oh, so nice. I treasure both. I did once write to Tony Blair. Oh, yeah. What about? Oh, it's about a headline in The Sun that I objected to. And I was a very... It was... I mean, I was much younger then. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very long time ago, mm. uh, back in the 90s. And I did get a response back. Um, but it was from Alistair Campbell. Ah, well, that's something, though, now. It's something. He's almost know. as famous as Tony Blair. Well, Blaine, he is isn't now, he? yes. Yeah. But there you go. So I did, I did get a response back from Alistair Campbell. Christine says, I wrote to King Charles after um, the Queen, the last Queen, died, uh, including sorry cards with drawings from 10 year old students. Um, and King Charles sent me a lovely card with him as a young boy with his mother. Mm. That's what we heard earlier, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and also sent one to the students at the school. They were so excited, as I was, to get this card personally signed. A lovely thing. These small gestures make a huge difference, mm, really actually. Do. Anyway, keep your thoughts coming through. GBviews at gbnews.com. And that outpouring of support, whether you write something to them or post it online or even just hold them in your thoughts and prayers, but that outpouring of support has been huge. And Kensington Palace have said really that the Prince and Princess of Wales are enormously touched by the kind messages they've received following Catherine's cancer diagnosis. And the statement from the palace follows, of course, the unprecedented video message she released on Friday evening, where she talked about the fact that she was undergoing preventative chemotherapy after tests done after her surgery showed that cancer had been present. Uh, well, let's talk to royal writer and photographer Ian Lloyd, who joins us now. Morning to you, Ian. I mean, it... Being I guess it, I guess it isn't a huge surprise in a sense that actually this has led to this huge support for Catherine and William. Well, that's right. Now we know the um, the story, so to speak, the backstory, because there was all that odd thing about you know, is she really ill? How ill is she? Um, what's the situation? Where was William at the service for King Constantine and things like that? A lot of sort of speculation out there and then there was a lot of nastiness wasn't there so um i think that's that's helped that and made certain people feel quite guilty i think yes i mean and it's lovely that that uh, we've we've been hearing all morning that these um letters and cards actually do get through to people as big deal and important as the king and as the princess and that they read as many of them as they can and write back which um we found this morning to be really encouraging yeah, I mean, I think the, um, the even the late Queen uh, used to um, open a percentage that um, that had been sent to her because she said she she likes to know what people are thinking, and she said sometimes that people say that she, uh, the buck stops here with her. You know that people she she would have letters saying I've tried everybody else and I don't know where to go to, so I'm sending it to you. The one good thing about sending a letter to the um, the royal family is if you've got a particular problem, is that quite often they send them on to the right, the relevant Secretary of State. So it could be health or it could be transport or whatever. And therefore it gets actioned. If you've got a letter saying, you know, the Queen sent this, what are you going to do about it? Or the King sent it. And they do reply, Camilla's very good. I mean, a lot of, I know a lot of people have had handwritten notes from Camilla thanking them. And, and I think it does make a great deal of difference to them because they don't 
they're surrounded by people who say, you know, the right thing and yes, you've done a really good job, but you never know until you get a letter from somebody who it's directly affected a member of the public. So it's very, very important for them. Yeah, and it's it's one of those things, isn't it? We look up to the royal family, but they need us don't they as much as we need them they need our support to be able to continue and i think it's it, it's nice that not only when they get that but that they appreciate that yeah and the other thing is that um i mean i've seen one or two negative things in the last day or two i've put things on twitter stroke x and you know some people say well it's all right for them they've had a lot of you know, privilege and, and so on. But there, I always argue that theirs is in the public eye, ours isn't. I mean, mm. you can withdraw and you can... I mean, fe people face all kinds of serious illness and bereavement in different ways. And you want to, you know, some people run away from it. Some people uh, cope in a stoic way. Other people get very emotional. And you want to do that privately. You want to be able to, um, you know, take the dog for a walk in Windsor Park without being harassed and photographed and so on. So I think theirs is a very challenging uh, situation and it's it's not always easy. And also particularly for Prince William, a lot of people focus on, on Catherine at the moment, but you know, he lost his mum at 36 and could potentially have lost his wife at 42, you know, and the king's ill and he's lost his parents, grandparents in the last couple of years. So he's under a lot of pressure as well. And I was a carer yeah. once and holding it together as a carer is actually, it's very challenging because you've got to keep the show on the road, haven't you? You've got to yes. kind of um, look after the children and um, be the face of the family, and that's not always easy. No, because no, at some not. point it'll hit him, as you were saying yesterday. Mm, it will. Ian, thanks very much indeed. What has Morning. struck me through a, a lot of this, I know it's an old phrase, but the idea of it being a gilded cage, mm. actually, because you can't... I mean, nobody else... We wouldn't be put in this position of having to make announcements and videos and all the rest of it when we weren't well. Um, it is a gilded cage. It's how you handle it. I don't think there are many of us who'd swap roles with them. Not when you think about it. Not with all of these stress. And, and stress is such a, um, a terrible thing, actually. I think we're beginning to understand how appalling stress can be. Mm. And they're under it all the time, actually, by the look of it. But also, when you... We can't do anything right All talking about our retirements. Mm. They don't get one. No. Actually, do they? I mean, look at Her Majesty no, and, Queen Elizabeth. Oh, well, that talk used to be about um, how Prince Charles was just waiting, waiting, basically, for his mother to die so that he could fulfil his role uh, in the world. And very clearly, we all saw how terribly, terribly affected he was by his mother's death. Mm. And, and you could just... I mean, he, he really did feel it. Um, as you would. Why did we expect anything else? I don't know. Because we don't perceive them as quite human in a way, which yeah, is terribly that's... wrong of us, mm. actually. Mm. Anyway, keep your thoughts coming through this one. Particularly if you've been in touch, if you have written to a royal, and love to hear your story about why you wrote to them, really, and whether you heard anything back. Mm. Clearly, they do get back to you. Which is nice. Now, at seven... Uh, sorry, at uh, 12 minutes past seven, espionage fears have taken over Westminster as a small group of MPs have apparently been summoned over fears of a new wave of state-backed interference. Yeah, the Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden, is expected to tell Parliament tomorrow that Beijing is behind a string of recent cyber-attacks on MPs and peers. And amongst those summoned include Sir Ian Duncan Smith, former Tory Minister Tim Loughton, the crossbencher up here, Lord Alton, and the SNP MP Stuart Macdonald. And let's talk to political author Owen Bennett. Do we know, Owen, what's going on? Well, I think, you know, we like to think of spying as sort of James Bond with a, you know, a dry martini. Uh, but actually, we know that spycraft is not like that now. And, and people like Ian Duncan Smith have been, you know, really uh, vocal in, in concerns over China and their espionage tactics. And you only need to look at, for example, what's going on in America where they're trying to ban TikTok because they said that TikTok is like having 100 million spy balloons on phones across the US. So... This, this front of espionage is very much, you know, it's been going on for a while now. And some would say that people in the West are perhaps a bit too slow to pick up on it. But remember, there is a general election coming this year. And I guess there are fears that this could be something that might try and interfere with that. It is astonishing, isn't it? I mean, it's the stuff of spy novels, but it's actually happening. I suppose we shouldn't be that shocked, really. It's bound to happen. Um, I just wonder what these MPs and peers are going to think when they're confronted with it, because very clearly they individually have been targeted in some way. 
I mean, they probably won't be surprised. These guys are pretty on the ball. The MPs that, that are, and I remember the House of Lords that are um, being summoned. That you know, that they the reason why they're speaking out against China is precisely because of this. And and you know, like you said, this is something that's which we shouldn't be surprised about. In October, I think it was 2023, there was a sort of unprecedented meeting of the head of the Five Eyes uh, group of spy chiefs, including the head of the MI5, who said that 20,000. Um, people in the UK have been approached covertly online by, you know, people from China trying to get them to do a little bit of spying for them. Uh, I think it shows now that, you know, you, it no longer needs to be sort of meetings in, in speakeasy bars. It can be someone in China reaching out to someone over, you know, an interconnection to someone in the UK. And people could be recruited without perhaps even realising, you know, download this bit of software, can you send us a link to this, all that kind of stuff. So it is very different, but it's that's the kind of basic level, but it's the more aggressive stuff where actually they're targeting lawmakers and policy chiefs. And that's why you've seen governments across the world, the UK, Canada, New Zealand, the EU, who have banned members of their administrations from having TikTok on their phones, for example, over fears that this is being used uh, to assist with Beijing spying activities. Mm. Um, let's be realistic, though. As, as disturbing as it may be, we're doing it to them, aren't we? Well, of course, I'm sure no one in my five or my six would say that. But yes, exactly, you know what? This is this is the new Cold War, right? Uh, this is this is the way that it, that it is now. So I'm sure that what we're doing, you know, what they're doing to us, we're trying to do to them because it is a it is a basis. It's a tech arms race now, isn't it? It used to be all done with nuclear weapons. Of course, we still have that, but now it's very much to do with tech. Uh, it's very much to do with how you can infiltrate. Uh, the other side behind it, enemy lines using technology and politicians have to be aware of that and that's why like I said a lot of governments have banned TikTok from their employees phones because they realize that that is you know a little spy balloon right there on the phone. Oh, okay. One more thing for politicians to worry about isn't it mm. or to think of first. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, Owen thanks very much indeed good to see you this morning. It is things like that I mean it, you know what, what is being embedded in your phone do you, if you have some of these programmes yeah, on? Whether your phones are listening to you. And for most of us, it doesn't matter, actually. Yeah, but for most of us, it's just as harmless as... as well, although I find it irritating, when a cookie comes up on your computer, just because you expressed interest in something once, suddenly you get followed, mm. you get followed all the time on it, don't you? Mm. Do you ever do that thing with Google where you sort of think, oh, someone said, oh, let's meet up at this cafe or something? Mm -hmm. And you Google it, because I don't live in London, so see if you Google it, see where it is in London. And it'll say, oh, you visited here in 2007. Oh, gosh. No. Or whatever. Yeah, just all of that. And you think, Whoa. That's spooky. And that's something we accept. So, oh, we totally accept yeah. that. That's just part of the software, isn't it? So you, so go, you can only imagine it must be a million times worse yeah. if somebody's out to get you. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Not that I'm paranoid or anything. No. No. No, let's not, don't worry about it too much. No. Don't get your knickers in a twist. No. Not worth, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Um, 7.17, let's have a look at some of the other stories coming into the newsroom. And the UN chief, Antonio Guterres, has renewed calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza as he went to the Egyptian side of the Rafah crossing. He called on Israel to give total unfettered access to human humanitarian goods throughout Gaza. Earlier this week, a UN-backed food security assessment said 1.1 million people in Gaza were struggling with catastrophic hunger and starvation. Ukraine is working to restore power supplies after the biggest Russian attack on its power grid. The attack killed at least five people and put Europe's biggest nuclear station at risk. President Zelensky is calling for urgent international assistance, saying that Russian terrorism is only possible because Ukraine lacks modern air defence systems. The knife campaigner Richard Taylor has died at 75 after a long battle with cancer. His 10-year-old son, Damalola, was killed way back in 2000. Hard to believe it's that long ago. Uh, in what became one of Britain's highest profile crimes, the loss led Richard and his late wife, Gloria, to set up a trust aimed at supporting disadvantaged young people. He said his son's death was the result of enormous problems in society, but he wanted his legacy to be one of hope. Well, that's very sad because it's like the end of an era. Mm, both, I mean, both of them. Well, all three of them. Dead. All three of them are dead now. Yeah. Um, 
but they did a lot of good, a lot of ama amazingly courageous campaigning. But you never forget the face of Damalola, do you? You don't, and I was just thinking then, it, what, to think he would be 34 <laughs> now. Yeah, to us, he's still a little boy. Yeah. Very sad. It is very, very sad. End of an era, as they say. All right. right. 19 minutes past seven, should we catch up with the weather? We should. Here's Marco. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Sunday promises to be a much quieter day weather-wise across the UK than on Saturday, drier, brighter and less blustery too. There are still one or two showers around today, particularly towards the north of Scotland, uh, still wintry across the hilltops there, but elsewhere the winds, as I say, are much lighter, more in the way of sunshine around, any showers very isolated, and with that extra bit of sunshine and the winds being that much lighter too, it should feel a bit warmer than on Saturday. Temperatures peaking in the south and southeast at around about 12 or 13 Celsius, 13 there in London is 55 in Fahrenheit, nearer average towards the north at 8 to 11 Celsius. As we go through the evening, we'll start to see some outbreaks of rain working their way in from the west, pushing in across parts of Northern Ireland and other westernmost areas. Whereas uh, towards the north and east, as we go through Sunday night, we'll hold on to some clearer conditions. Here it will turn quite chilly, at least for a time, because of a touch of frost here. Whereas out towards the west, that cloud, wind and rain will start to lift temperatures. And by the morning on Monday, temperatures uh, in Belfast, for example, will be around 6 Celsius, 43 in Fahrenheit. That sets the scene for a bit of an east-west split in our weather on Monday. Wet at times, fairly blustery conditions developing out towards the west. Some quite heavy bursts of rain at times. We do hold on to sunnier skies towards the north and east, with some cloud gradually pushing in there as we go through the day from the west. But in the best of that sunshine, and with the wind staying fairly light out towards the east, temperatures will climb into double figures, but feeling cooler with that wind and rain out towards the west. That's it. See you soon. Bye-bye. That warm feeling inside from Box Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Uh, thank you for all your messages <laughs> and tweets and all sorts about my hand bleeding. I had no idea. Oh, I could see that. She the, spotted it. I spotted it, but I thought I won't say anything on air. I don't want to alarm anyone in case nobody's seen it, but you've all seen you've it. You've all seen it. So I, I, it was, I was blood the, running down your hand. I was the last one to know. There you go. You as, must have uh, just scratched yourself. I must have just caught it on. So I have no idea. Didn't feel a thing. Uh, as my grandma would have said, oh, you've got skin like paper. Yeah, but you're very observant, so thank you, you are, very yes, much. Yes, you are, but it's all it's fine, though. It's only tiny little... It's tiny, isn't it? Yeah, but it looked horrific. I'm a bleeder. <laughs> I am a bleeder. Once oh, yeah. I start, yeah. Lovely. Anyway, thank you. You needed to know that, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> Do I overshare? <laughs> Might have been a touch there, Ooh. who knows. Right, should we, should we get on with our great British giveaway? Uh, because there's tech and treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash available. It's an amazing prize, it could be yours. Here's how you enter. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax free cash, text GB Win to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Now, I know you will have all been braced for it last night. Earth hour. Half past eight to half past nine. I'd already switched my lights out. Oh, yeah. So I did, sleep in bed. Did you turn the lights off to mark Earth hour like all the big venues did? Or is it just more virtue signalling? We'll debate that next. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. 
Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. It's 7.26, good morning. Now, you've been sending in some pictures, thank you, of cards received from the royal family. Stephen wrote to say, uh, my daughter, six at the time, wrote to the Queen on her jubilee. I don't know which jubilee that is now. Uh, platinum? Uh, can't see. Oh, platinum, there you mm. go. And got this reply. She also had one from the King. Oh, That's nice. lovely. That's worth keeping, isn't it? Michael wrote in to say, Attached is a letter, not from a royal, but from Buckingham Palace dated June 1953, thanking my late grandfather, a chief inspector in the Mets, Thanes Division, who gave a lift to Prince Philip's equerry, Michael Parker. I remember that name. Michael Parker, yeah, he was in The Crown, wasn't it? Uh, that's right, he features in The Crown. And that was all after the coronation. Wow, definitely worth keeping hold of. Yeah. All those. Uh, Rosalind's written in to say, I wrote to the late Queen Elizabeth regarding my disapproval of the then Prince Charles marrying Camilla Parker Bowles. Not only did I get a reply, but the Queen passed my letter on to Prince Charles and I got a reply from him as well. well I'd love to read those a bit closer. I want say. to see what they said. I wonder, Rosalind, um, Rosalind, if you've changed your mind. No. Yes, things are very different now. Things are different. Or are they? Some people haven't changed their minds, but... No. You see, even a letter of disapproval got through. See, I'm surprised. I mean, no offence to you, Rosalind. If I'd have been, um, if I'd have been Prince Charles, I'd have chucked it in the bin <laughs> <laughs> and said, well, it's not your business, well, it's who I'm Except it is. Well, he, yeah. he was the prince and the heir to the throne. And, he ha and she had a right to his reply, in a way. You could argue, couldn't you? Well, you, yeah, well, you could argue. Well, that's obviously what he thought. Well, yes. It's part of their duty. But that's why he's now the king and I'm but a commoner. Yeah, and that's a little bit of history, though, isn't it? Oh, well, it is, Those yeah. letters and cards are worth hanging on to. But do get back in touch, Rosalind. Let us know if you now approve of the yes, Queen. Yes, if you've changed your mind. Because she's oh, doing a smashing she's job. She's doing a brilliant have job. have met her, I have to say, and she was... Yeah, you were impressed, weren't you? Really impressed. And I sort of wasn't expecting to be, but was really, really impressed. Um, very personable, lovely, actually. 
There you go. Now, what were you up to last night? Because you might not have noticed. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they were all doing it. We're watching out. Uh, but big landmarks right across the country and across the world switched their lights off for an hour last night for Earth Hour. Yeah, not just the big landmarks, actually. We were all meant to do it. Sit there in darkness. There, look, the Eiffel uh, Tower getting yes. dark. Uh, there you go. Uh, it's the 16th year it's happened. Just to be in darkness. It's so difficult what's... to tell where it is I when it's in darkness, one is. isn't it? Oh, there you go. And what, oh, that's is that the Burj Khalifa or something like I that? Don't it's know. all that sort of thing. Um, but anyway, tell when they're all turning their lights out. Oh, there you go. Um, does it make any impact, or is it virtue signalling? Well, joining us now, the leader of the Climate Party, Ed Gemmell, and uh, Donica McCarthy, director of Climate Media Coalition. Donica, you're probably the first uh, person we should go to to explain to us what Earth Hour is meant to be doing. What's it meant to be saying? Sure. It was an initiative started by the Worldwide Fund for Nature in 2007, where it said that for an hour each, each year, we would do something for the Earth whether it's turning off lights, um, uh, changing our bank account from a high carbon bank account like Barclays to a low one like the co-op or uh, Trio does, or deciding we will contact our, our MP to say, what are you doing about climate? <clears throat> so the day where you spend an hour, whether turning off lights, being energy efficient, or doing something positive for nature and for the climate emergency. Well, then um, you've got to, uh, Ed, as leader of the Climate Party, you'd support this then, wouldn't you? I think it's fantastic. So I think it's a, an amazing way of raising awareness all around the world. I think it's a great um, idea by the WWF to, to say to us all that we've got to be doing something for the climate um, at that time. So if you're not turning your lights off at home, you're actually thinking about it and doing something about it. I think it's fantastic. I think it's a big wake up call for us as well, that it's literally happening all around the world. I mean, whether it's France, Italy, Greece, Vietnam, China, Japan, Singapore, Australia, everyone's doing it. That should be a wake-up call to Britain to say that everyone around the world is thinking about this and is going to do something. But did you turn your lights off last night, Ed, at 8.30? Well, the, the, the call by WWF was to do something that is the right thing to be doing for the planet. So I was preparing for this interview to make sure that I could come on and talk about the right things. That's a bit too clever an answer, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, I turn oh, my sorry, lights out because be I go politician. to bed at about that time. Um, what about you, Donica? Did you turn everything off in your own home? Or, no, or, or were you looking towards the big gestures from, you know, the likes of the Eiffel Tower and Big Ben? Well, I think um, I've been keeping the pledge since the 1992 Earth Summit. The world leaders in 1992 asked people to turn off the lights in rooms that they're not in and to turn off the heating in rooms that they're not in. And I've done that ever since. And yesterday, to mark Earth, uh, Earth Hour, um, my whole house was free from the grid. I was produced more electricity yesterday than I than I used, so I helped other people cut turn their carbon footprint for their lights off as well. So, and the other thing I did yesterday was I celebrated a whole year since last year's Earth Hour of not being in a car once. I set myself a challenge. Could I not be in a car? Because cars and transport and flying are the single biggest source of carbon emissions in the United Kingdom. So I thought, could I set myself a challenge to do that? And I did it. So I celebrated th yesterday. But the problem is, it's all just... I mean, you're, right, you're, you're putting your beliefs into action, Donica. Fair enough. And all respect to you for doing that. But for everybody else, it's just virtue signalling, isn't it? I mean, the Eiffel Tower... You know, if France really cared about it, then the Eiffel Tower wouldn't be you know, lit through all hours of darkness and twinkling on the hour. I mean, it's... You know, so it is nothing but virtue signalling. And most of us don't care two hoots about it, Ed, do we? We didn't even know it was happening. Right. Well, I think, Stephen, actually, it's a, it's a lot further than that. I mean, I talked about a wake-up call, but it, almost rather glibly. This shows that the entire world is thinking about this issue. And at the moment, Britain's behind the game. You know, we have got to start moving up our action, not only because the altruistic idea of, of saving the world and reducing emissions, but because this is the way that the entire world is going industrially. We're moving in that direction. And this signal, virtue or not, from around the entire world is saying they're all taking it seriously. And what we need to do is pull forward all our targets, both on dealing with climate and on the nature um, outside, but also make sure that Britain is prepared industrially to take action on this and make money for Britain. This is saying, look, guys, there's a big issue. The whole world recognises it. 
And the first mover who gets there and starts to do something about it is going to be building up its industrial base and helping its economy. And that's what we need to be doing and doing it fast. Well, look, we'll leave it there. But I think I, I didn't realise. I thought it was just about turning off lights um, and saving energy or whatever. But I think what, what you were saying earlier there, Donico, about the fact that it, it is an hour where you can think about doing something for the planet. Um, and it just gets you thinking the rest of the year, maybe, as you've done. We'll leave it there. We haven't got any more time on this. Thank you. I know you've got so much more to say. Thank you so much, gentlemen, both. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right, uh, before we take a short break where you can ponder whether or not to make a cup of tea, uh, Aidan's here with the sport. What have you got coming up, Aidan? Well, we'll find out who fluffed their lines for England last night at Wembley as Brazil won at, in that friendly, international friendly, of course, a big match, and a guy called Endrick scored the goal, a huge tonic for him. And no sign of the sun setting on Andy Murray's Indian summer. We'll see you after the break. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. It's 7.50. No, it's not. It's 7.38. Where did you get that from? I don't know. I'm not with it this morning. I'm <laughs> bleeding out, and I'm bleeding out. Oh, sorry. Out. Yeah, yeah, you're bleeding. Oh, dear, uh, what a shame. <laughs> <laughs> Aidan's got the sport for his morning. Good morning to you both. Well, it was... I mean, it was a shambolic, scrappy performance by England last night at Wembley. I wouldn't say shambolic, oh, but come on. scrappy. Scrappy, certainly. Look, when you have players who are chomping at the bit to stake... I mean, with the Euros are three months away. And the plane is about... It's on the runway. There are seats and then and the names haven't been assigned. And suddenly you get an opportunity when Harry Kane is out. Yeah. And That's the Bakayo Saka is out. How long out. is he going to be out? Oh, he's, well, he's going to be out. He, he won't make Tuesday's game against Belgium. 
But and he'll be fit for the Euros and everything. He'll be oh, fine. It's, only, it's only a matter of a week. But the, the, the protocol with the international sides is that so that they know that you're not, you're not swinging the lead or anything like that. They know that they, they invite you to the camp at St George's Park to prove that you're injured, effectively. Oh. That's the that's a, oh. that's a UEFA and FIFA um, stipulation. So he's, he's out. We know he's out for Tuesday. So Ollie Watkins gets a chance last night. Huge chance. Huge chance. Fires over the bar in the first half, should have scored. Ivan Tony will be looking at that. He was the guy who was overlooked yeah. yesterday. And he'll be thinking, well, my chances on Tuesday against Belgium, if I can do better than that, surely he's in the bump seat for going to, going to Germany. We know that Harry Kane's going to go. He's the captain, of course. But the standing captain last night had a bad night as well. Kyle Walker, the Manchester City defender, he injured his hamstring. Uh, Lewis Dunk came on from Brighton, another player very much on the periphery since 2017, didn't distinguish himself. Well, I can ask my football question, my one and only football I question. I the answer. What was the mood like in the dressing room? I mean, is the morale low? No, I wouldn't say morale is low because England is a happy place to be under Gareth Southgate. The only question is that with that squad being so good and so full of talent, is this a Ferrari being driven by a Peugeot driver? I.e., is Gareth Southgate good enough to, to manage this team? The team looked very pedestrian. Before. Well, yes, OK, it got, it got far, and, we, and we, we tend to think that because we're England, we have a divine right to win some of these tournaments. We've, we've thought that for the last 50-odd years. However, there, does, it, there is always an element to me that England look a bit, little bit pedestrian, particularly against the really good sides like Brazil. Brazil have been missing players last night. They've lost the last three matches. They're at a low ebb. They're at the lowest ebb they've been in 21 years. But nonetheless, they are a threat wherever they go. And England didn't impose themselves on them enough. And, and when you get to a major tournament, as I say, only three months away now, you really have to be pressing your claims to do that. I do think this will be Gareth Southgate's last tournament. He's been linked yeah. with the Manchester United job as well. So I don't think he'd be shortage of any takers. Sometimes you need a change. But someone rang, rang in the radio show last night and said, maybe in a few, month, a few months' time we'll be saying... We miss Gareth Southgate. Yes. Well, that's how fickle the game is these days, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Nonetheless, Brazil won with uh, late on with a goal by a 17-year-old player called Endrick. Yeah, so he'll be celebrating. He will indeed. Yeah, Tell us happy, about yeah. Sven Jürgen Eriksson and his lifelong dream. He had a lifelong dream to manage Liverpool. He wasn't able to disclose it until relatively recently. It was only seven weeks ago, I think, that he announced that he was uh, he only had less than a, month, a year to live. Uh, after being diagnosed with cancer, which has spread around his, uh, his body yeah. after exploratory tests. So he finally felt it was the right time to announce that he was a Liverpool fan. And so Liverpool reached out to him and said, look, we have a Legends game, a chat for charity for the LFC Foundation, which tackles youth unemployment and social issues in the city. We have it every, every March. Why don't you come along and manage the team? in the absence of Jurgen Klopp. And that's what he's always wanted to he's do. That's what he's wanted to do. And they let, him, they let him do that, and he walked out in front of the crowd yesterday, and they gave, it was a full house. Uh, they gave him a rapturous round of applause. They gave him a standing ovation. They're saying, you'll never walk alone. Oh. He was quite... That, is, um, that, that must have been really moving. It is. He was, never, he was never the most emotional as the England manager. He was always the ice-cool Swede, wasn't he? Mm. Uh, with a fiery Italian girlfriend, but this time he was... <laughs> that's, that was oh. that's, what, that's what the Red Tops said. I was working yeah. with the Red Tops at the time, I might add. But he... He was, he was moved to tears yesterday a little bit, I think. Okay. He was, well, maybe not tears, but his eyes welled up. Pete Price put a photo on Twitter, actually, saying he met him afterwards, and uh, it was a wonderful thing for the club to do. And they raised a few quid as well, let's not forget. Liverpool mm -hmm. with John, John Barnes, John Aldridge, Ian Rush, Fernando Torres, Stephen Gerrard. He's a real, there was a real royalty of uh, Liverpool. Well, he would have loved that too if he's been oh, he a would, lifelong yeah. fan. Well, he was actually... I mean, he was, had a very successful managerial career, and he actually said that in the late 70s, when Liverpool were in their pomp at home and in Europe, he actually wrote to the club and said, look, can I come on and watch some training sessions? And he went along and watched and saw these players just training, and they only allowed to touch the ball twice. So you had to, you, the, the, the emphasis was moving on the ball quickly. And that's, that was the template for playing football oh, really? many years after that. And he carried that into his career as well. And he was phenomenally successful around with various international type sides. And he was with Lazio, of course. He won the Serie A with, uh, with them. I tell you what, after, sure, after Princess that. Catherine saying at the end of her message, you are not alone. Yes. And for the, for the Liverpool fans to sing, you'll never walk alone. And Sven's sitting there knowing he's only got a very limited time yes, to live. Right. That must have been incredible. Moment. It was. I mean, he said afterwards, he said it was a beautiful day. Yeah. And it was something he'd, he was longing to do oh, all, the, all his life. He did, he did actually... He was actually close to becoming a Liverpool manager at some time in the past, but he didn't explain exactly why it didn't yeah. happen. Um, wasn't it a beautiful day for Max Verstappen? No, well, at least we've got a story on the track. Uh, the well, F1. yeah, it's a bit... A bit it's, Processional, it's changed things up a bit. Yeah, it has changed things up a little bit. He's, uh, he's had, it's his first retirement in, in two years, but he wasn't the only one. Uh, Lewis Hamilton... Uh, 
bowed out at the, the 70s. And George Russell. George Russell as well, yeah, exactly. So it was, uh, but at least we got a story. It's a tricky track, though, down in uh, Australia. And it, look, it may turn out to be Verstappen's only defeat of the season. I mean, he won 21 out of 22 last season. So at least we've got a little bit of a chink of a story in the first, in the first couple of uh, races. Uh, Lewis Hamilton doesn't move on until next season to, to Ferrari. So he's will having. He, I mean, will he have as much fire in his belly? Yes. For... Oh, I think so. I don't. I, I, it's a little bit of a Federer situation when he was kind of usurped by Nadal. He fought back and won many more Grand Slams because he sensed that there was a changing of the guard. And I think that Lewis Hamilton, he's stuck on seven world titles, I think, tied with Michael Schumacher. He'd love to win the eighth. So that's the motivation. He'd also like to slap Verstappen down after the controversy of that win in, uh, in 20, 2021. Mm -hmm. And I think, at the eight, I think Hamilton's, Ham, Hamilton will be 40 soon, I think. Not, not, not too far off. He hasn't got too many, too many seasons left in him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he'd love to hear you say that. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking of him as the as the kids doing well. I know, I know. I think his first one was 2008, I think it was. God. 2007, maybe. It's terrifying. I, know. I don't know what happens to time. 2008, um, it was, yeah. There you go. He's nearly as old as us. I know he is, yeah. Um, <laughs> all right, for now, thanks very much. See you we'll see you later. Do stick with us. In a couple of moments, we'll be going through the newspapers. It's next. and Co. Weekdays from 6pm. You think this country needs new gas power stations? Apparently, this will all be about trying to get some form of energy security. Rishi Sunak has upset people today with this suggestion, people saying that actually this would do more damage to climate change uh, than it would do good. Where are you on it, Richard? Uh, I'll tell you exactly where. We need a lot more gas power stations and nuclear power stations because quite often the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Last week, we imported 16% of all our electricity because we haven't got enough capacity in the UK and we're now totally over-reliant on renewables. Um, the part of the problem is the lack of storage capacity, which mm. the government has finally got round to addressing. I think this as backup is actually quite a sensible idea. But they are not doing anything, as far as I can tell. At the moment, it will be retrofitted to have storage capability, which seems to be utterly bonkers. I mean, anyone who's got solar panels, um, you know, you know very well you're storing up energy. So it's about storage as much as production. And they could have gone, you know, 20 years ago, we could have had nuclear power. You know, we, we could have done more. We haven't looked far enough ahead in the future, and we are in grave danger of making the same mistake. I mean, the other side of this, is what is the difference going to be? Blackouts are, you know, they're irritating and... Irritating? It'd be disastrous to well, destroy would our now. economy. Well, they would be now, but, you know, um, some of us remember three-day weeks and things like that. And in fact, you know, I grew up thinking that everybody had, you know, at least a couple of days a week when they had to eat off a primer <laughs> stove and things. This is, again, I don't want to harp on, but this is one of the problems in the politics in our country, isn't it? So many politicians, they just think in election cycles, Absolutely. they just think, what can I do and yeah. say to get my own backside re-elected uh, at the next general election? They're not always looking ahead. Uh, actually, politics aside, what is genuinely the best thing for this country? Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Seven forty-seven. Let's see what's in the papers this morning with deputy editor at Spiked Fraser Myers and editor at large at Times Money Mentor Georgie Frost. Morning to you both. Let's get my list out. Fraser, Sunday Express. There's this lovely story of a little girl who Princess Catherine got to know 
when the little girl herself was um, facing a horrible battle against cancer. Yes, uh, Mila, only eight years old, uh, had a, a horrible fight with uh, leukaemia. Um, and particularly, you know, it was particularly hard, as if that wasn't hard enough, um, because she was going through this during the pandemic. So mm -hmm. she had to actually... She was living in the family home, and her own family had to live separately from her uh, so that she could be shielded, because undergoing things like chemotherapy put you, you know, at extra risk of, of catching COVID, even if you're only a young um, person like, like she was. Um, and so she was she, uh, it, the image of her um, waving at her father from, you know, her own home kind of ca captured Kate's heart. She pe appeared in this uh, photo book uh, that Kate put together and um, they also met uh, several times. And of course, Milo's wishing uh, the Princess of Wales, well. And what's yeah, lovely, nice. there was a lovely incident where they did meet up, must have been after, obviously after COVID was finished, and um, they met up at Holyrood, um, and uh, Catherine was wearing a red dress, I think, and she, she met Mila, and Mila was wearing a pink dress. Yeah. And Catherine said to her, is that your favourite colour, pink? And she said, yes, it's my favourite colour. And so Catherine got up, walked out, and changed into a pink dress. Aww. Didn't she? Yeah, nice. isn't that lovely? Mm. She oh, must well. carry her wardrobe. Well, yeah. <laughs> Spare pink dress she must have them. thought, well, I've got a pink dress in the suitcase. That's the pink dress suitcase. <laughs> Come on. But no, that's, that's nice. It's little things like that make a huge Absolutely. difference. Absolutely. And they stayed in touch ever since. Yeah. They? Mm. Mm. Um, Georgie, can we have a look at the mm. Sunday Times and this um, idea that some of our politicians are being targeted by China? Yeah, nothing new here, but uh, there's a lot of talk about China. I suppose we're running up to an election. There's obviously concern about that. In the US, they're talking about banning TikTok, which is, of course, Chinese-owned. But like I said, this is, this is nothing new. But it does seem to me that, and maybe I'm being a bit unfair here, that government departments t tend to be slightly behind the curve, shall we say, with things like this. Mm. We've got a brand new wave of Gen AI, new technology coming in that's going to cause all sorts of problems. So, I, you know, I think they only banned TikTok but, on their phones last year. But is it... Can we ever beat this sort of thing? Because whatever we come up with to ban TikTok and create, you know, security walls, whatever they call them, to filter everything... Out, the minute we invent something, it gets beaten. The reality is you are never going... We are never going to beat cyber criminals. Oh. I actually spoke to an expert very recently about just this who said, we have to get used to it. Basically, create your crown jewels, protect the most important thing for you, and accept, and this is for business or for governments, accept that there will be breaches around that. So what the government needs to do is focus on things to protect. They need to make sure that their security systems are as tight as possible, particularly, as we say, like running up to an election. But as you say, this is, you know, we're playing a game of whack-a-mole. They're yeah, far more are, sophisticated. And when you hear, you know, Chinese government, they'll have the weight of a Chinese population, which is, what, a fifth of the world's population? That mm. is quite a battle on their hands, the government. Yeah. There's always more you can do, though, and I think, you know, lots of uh, government computers in particular are very outdated. I mean, people might remember back in 2017 when the NHS uh, yes. came under cyber attack, and one of the reasons it was so vulnerable was, was because, you know, the, the, a lot of computers people used were Windows XP, and those were, had been out of date yeah. for about five years already. I'll tell you what, MPs and their members of staff are changing computers at left, right and centre, mm. all at taxpayers' expense at the minute. No, they? I can but, um, tell you that. But, Every um, time there's a new budget and they're buying new iPads and heaven knows what. But the biggest breaches come from human error, without uh, a doubt. And I would say just on this, and it's a bit beyond China, but just do the safe things, don't use the same passwords. It's all those sorts of things, oh, yeah. isn't it, as well? Um, can we change tack to something just light and fluffy? Of course. And black bears in Woburn. So this is a safari park in Bedfordshire, and um, there are amazing images of bears uh, actually having a little pedalo ride. So the enclosure was flooded and the uh, oh. keepers, if you like, uh, decided, well, we've got a spare um, swan pedalo. Um, it doesn't have any pedals, so it can't be used by human beings. Let's put it in the enclosure and see what happens. And the bears being the curious animals that they are, have, mm. they're all over it. They're loving it. I love that. Look at that. They're all on board. Everyone's getting into it. Everyone wants to go. <laughs> you see, I, I love that. I've been on one of those swans at Woburn. 
<laughs> it might be that very it might one. Be that one. <laughs> You'd never know. Um, I just think stuff like that's just. We need a bit of heart warming yeah, stuff that's at the minute, true. don't we? Well, that you certainly true. learn, don't you, that the, the keepers of, of um, these animals now that are in captivity, but they try and give them lots of. Uh, Stimulation. Yes. Mm. Different yeah. Things. They, they say they want to enrich the environment for yeah. them, uh, constantly. Well, that well, just shows are... that bears are curious. Yeah, they're not. But they're, I tell you what, these things and like zoos and things are. They're not zoo zoos. They're no. all conservation mm. Mm. projects, aren't they? Which is very important. Um, I want to conserve my bank account, yes. Georgie. Mm. Um, so, for looking at this, I, one place I won't be going for a new ironing board is Harrods. <laughs> Tell us this, about this ironing board. This is a... I, I think it's an ironing experience rather than just an ironing well. board. For £4,000, you'd like to think so. It's sort of psychedelic ironing board. It's got a built-in water feature thing that you can oh. steam it. I mean, the question, uh, as, as Fraser rightly asked when we were looking over this, was if you can afford a £4,000 ironing board, you could probably afford to just send your clothes to get ironed. However, mm. I worked out the maths. I don't just come in here unprepared. <laughs> and I think it would be about five years. And after that, you know, if you took it to a, a dry cleaner to get it done professionally, after five years, you know, actually, it's better getting the ironing board. But I do think it's a, a key feature about how we spend... Have they got a picture of the ironing ..a lot board? of money? Oh, we don't. But it's, is, it no. one of, is it one of these that has... It's got... It sucks, it's got a vacuum, or it can blow through the shirt? Cos I tell you, I know someone who's got one, an ironing system like that. Uh, William Hansen, the UK's leading etiquette expert. Oh. Is on, he's yes. all over Well, just if you are thinking of getting he's it, He's got though, an ironing system like that. A Harrods reviewer said... A little flimsy, considering how much it costs. So, <laughs> look, you know, if you were thinking of spending £4,000 on the ironing board, a little flimsy. I mean, it looks like a beast. I mean, it's quite course, hefty yeah. to carry it around. So. I don't know look, if you bought this from Harrods. £4,000 was... for... <laughs> Just don't it do out. the ironing. No, Send I wouldn't it bother. Out, yeah. hate it. Thanks both. <laughs> See you a little bit later on. Thank you. Here's your weather with Marco. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Sunday promises to be a much quieter day weather-wise across the UK than on Saturday. Drier, brighter and less blustery too. There are still one or two showers around today, particularly towards the north of Scotland. Uh, still wintry across the hilltops there, but elsewhere the winds, as I say, are much lighter, more in the way of sunshine around, any showers very isolated, and with that extra bit of sunshine and the winds being that much lighter too, it should feel a bit warmer than on Saturday. Temperatures peaking in the south and southeast at around about 12 or 13 Celsius, 13 there in London is 55 in Fahrenheit, near average towards the north at 8 to 11 Celsius. As we go through the evening, we'll start to see some outbreaks of rain working their way in from the west, pushing in across parts of Northern Ireland and other westernmost areas. Whereas uh, towards the north and east, as we go through Sunday night, we'll hold on to some clearer conditions. Here it will turn quite chilly, at least for a time, because see a touch of frost here. Whereas out towards the west, that cloud, wind and rain will start to lift temperatures. And by the morning on Monday, temperatures uh, in Belfast, for example, will be around 6 Celsius, 43 in Fahrenheit. That sets the scene for a bit of an east-west split in our weather on Monday. Wet at times, fairly blustery conditions developing out towards the west. Some quite heavy bursts of rain at times. We do hold on to sunnier skies towards the north and east, with some cloud gradually pushing in there as we go through the day from the west. But in the best of that sunshine, and with the wind staying fairly light out towards the east, temperatures will climb into double figures, but feeling cooler with that wind and rain out towards the west. That's it. See you soon. Bye-bye. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. Time is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, 
text GBWIN to 84902. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Very good morning to you. It is 8 o'clock on Sunday, the 24th of March. Today, Kensington Palace has revealed the Princess of Wales is enormously touched by the outpouring of support following her cancer diagnosis. The Russian President Vladimir Putin has declared a day of mourning following the deaths of 143 in a Moscow terrorist attack. He's also made unsubstantiated claims about Ukraine being involved. Well, it's been claimed this morning that China's targeting senior politicians in Westminster through a string of cyber attacks. Four senior members of parliament, or three, I should say, plus a member of the House of Lords, have been called to an urgent meeting. And as landmarks around the world um, turned their lights off to mark Earth Hour last night, we've been asking, do you care? Today marks 80 years since one of the most famous events of the Second World War, the Great Escape. We'll be looking at how the anniversary is being marked across the country. It was an opportunity spurned for the England players staking their claim for a place on the plane to Germany for the Euros this summer as a 17-year-old scored Brazil's late winner. Better news, though, in the tennis for Andy Murray. He's into the third round of the Miami Open. More later. Hello, today looks much quieter weather-wise across the UK than on Saturday. There'll be more in the way of sunshine around and lighter winds too. And with those lighter winds, it should feel a bit warmer. I'll have all the details a little bit later. Morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Anne Diamond, and this is Breakfast on GB News. Fabulous Thank letters. Thank you so much for getting in touch. About, we've been asking all morning, have you ever written to a royal and have they ever written back? 
Rachel says. Uh, right, no, you Rachel, wanted to read that, Rachel. This is a lovely one. Morning, Rachel. We have a very treasured letter from the Queen. You mean Queen Elizabeth. When my son Elliot was younger, he would often put his elbows on the table at mealtimes. And as my mother told me, you could only put your elbows on the table if you ever had permission from the Queen. <laughs> so he sent his letter of request off to the Queen. <laughs> Can I put my elbows on the table? And we were also touched that he did receive a reply. Sadly for him, though, she declined his request. I mean, that's just lovely, isn't it? That really is brilliant. Absolutely smashing that. <laughs> I bet she smiled when she saw that one. Lorraine's Absolutely is good as well, though. Uh, Lorraine says, I wrote to Princess Diana just after the announcement of her and Charles uh, were going to divorce. I told her I was going through a divorce at the time. Oh, excuse me, when I flip this over. Uh, and I could recognise the pain she was going through and wished her well. Uh, I received a handwritten reply from her. I was so shocked she'd bothered to do that, but absolutely elated. Diana was quite well known for doing that. She, she often mm. wrote back. Um, wouldn't you wish you'd got one of... You know, that, that's maybe why you should bother. Um, you think my letter will never get through. They won't care about a, a card from me. But clearly, they do get through. Not all of them, maybe, but they do. Mm. And Certainly a good number. Yeah, and, and occasionally um, it, it will touch something um, and they will write back. So, mm. wow. They're lovely absolutely ones. lovely. We've also been asking what you do for your retirement and you know, what your retirement plans are or if you're enjoying your retirement. Has or... retirement lived up to what you thought it would be? Uh, I've got to mention this one from Yvonne who says, Good morning, I'm watching from Javier in Spain. Mm. We retired here 32 years ago. We were lucky to retire early. Best decision we ever made. Still feels like paradise. Something for everyone to do. If you can afford to retire early, yeah. go for it. I know Javier very well. Um, I'm out there a lot. My parents spend a lot of time in Javier. Um, in fact, they're out there at the moment. Um, uh, it's a Is it lovely and warm and sunny It's there? lovely and warm nice. and it's suitably touristy, but not too much. You've got yeah. a beautiful hour and all. But to be the... retiring oh. somewhere where you say it still feels like paradise, I think that must just be so it's wonderful. The Though it was a bit misty yesterday, apparently, in Javier. Well, the Charmian says, good morning, Stephen and Anne. We are in our mid-70s, and yes, retirement is very busy for us. We have a special needs grandson who's seven and a half now, and he attends special school. We do the school run twice a day and then help with tea and bedtime. School holidays, of course, are extra busy. We've supported him and his younger brother from the start. So retirement has allowed us to take on this special job. We're just having a quiet cup of tea now because we've got the day off today. Best wishes. Well, best wishes from us to mm. enjoy a nice cup of tea and watching GB News. And this is how I want to be. Like Neil, who says, I retired at 60 after starting work at 16. Took me six months to settle into it. I can imagine that. But now I love it. Um, I, I'm quite artistic, love working with wood. Oh, that be uh, that's interesting. I'd like to see some of that. I now make acoustic guitars. Wow, you must be good. I do watercolours and tend my garden and play golf. There aren't enough days in the week. Ah. You see, that's, that's what you want to be, mm. retired but there still aren't enough days in the week to do all your lovely little bits and bobs. Don't you think it's weird? You think of something like woodworking and painting, watercolours, that sort of thing. So many people have mentioned those things. You do them when you're at school mm. and then life takes over, doesn't it? And well, having to, a living. Your job takes over, having to make a living, exactly, bringing up a family or something like that. And if you're not careful, you don't rediscover that you've still got that artistic thing mm. inside you. I like watching those woodworking videos on YouTube mm. where they just get a block of wood and then end up making a beautiful yeah. bowl and all the rest of it. And I've bought one or two off some of these sites. You, oh, can, actually, those, yeah. you can see it being made and yeah. then you can buy it. Mm. I love that. I'd love to do that, but you need a fair amount of kit. Yes, but yeah, but why I'd not? Love to have you a could goal. do that. That's something you could do, you see? That could be my retirement plan. Well, absolutely. Why not? could make wooden bowls uh, and sell making... them to you on YouTube. Yes. I fancy making stained glass windows. Do you? Oh, yeah. I used to do that, when, again, when I was at school. Um, you know, you, you used to use plastic mostly, but you, you find... Yeah. But you can do it... Um, you can, obviously, you can learn how to do it properly with lead and everything. And, um, and they're very artistic now and very modern stained glass windows. And I, I, I'd love to do that. You should make baubles. Baubles. What, like Christmas tree baubles? Yeah. yeah. Well, you made me a bauble. I made you a bauble, well, I it's did. Very it's good. very good. It's yeah. very, very good. I was very but, but impressed. But you need, a, you need a studio or an attic or yeah. a basement or something, don't you? Or a shed. Um, where you can... Because you do need specialist equipment for certain things. Mm. And if you're an artist as well, I mean, you need room to put all your easels and 
stuff. Eat some stuff. It's nice to know what you're getting up to in your retirement. Yeah. I think that's quite nice. I mean, it gives those who are about retire something to look forward to. Well, get in touch. GBviews at gbnews.com. Yeah. Give us a few ideas of unusual things, um, hobbies that you've taken up in retirement. I wonder what Catherine is. will do in her convalescence and, and things, because mm. she's obviously quite artistic. She's, she's very good on the piano. Yeah. I wonder if she's got stuff that, that she can do that will just, you know, help her in her recovery. Yeah, because and... she's got to work hard at relaxing. Yeah, it's well, a yes. way to put it. But yeah, yeah, she, she will. She will. Though, I have to say... She's got um, three young children. Yes, but some assistance, at least, yes, with that. Yeah. Even farm them out to the nannies a couple of days a week. Um, but there has been that. this... Oh, can't you? you? Can't, no, people used to say it to me, oh, you've got a nanny. That, you know, that makes it easy. It doesn't. That's one extra person to look after in the house. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Uh... I don't know, it's bad enough with the pets. Um, but anyway, there's been a huge outpouring of support over the last day, and Kensington Palace have said the Prince and Princess of Wales are enormously touched by the kind messages they've received following Catherine's cancer diagnosis. The statement from the palace follows the unprecedented video message, of course, that she recorded, where she actually did tell us what was happening and that she was undergoing preventative chemotherapy after the tests that were done on her initially after her first surgery showed that cancer had indeed been present. Well, earlier this morning, we spoke to former royal butler Grant Harold and royal biographer and photographer Ian Lloyd enough talking isn't it to love ones about it and this is where she's not only having to tell her family she's telling the, the country the world and it is a big step because the one thing i remember working for them or for her was it her privacy is everything to her you know it's it, for both of them it's really important and they've managed to get a really good balance between their private and the public i feel between private and public life but this is obviously something that would have it would, of course you know it would have absolutely devastated the family so soon after the king's diagnosis. But what's really interesting is the fact that the king has spoken openly and now she's done the same. This is this is very unusual because historically royals did not discuss health issues. As we know with the late Queen and the late Prince Philip, this was a no-go area. And here we've got a very modern royal family where they're actually openly talking about this, which is great because it's raising, it's not, I'm going to say raising awareness, it's getting people talking about it, probably hopefully, hopefully getting people to go and get themselves checked. And I think it's really important what she's done, uh, speaking about it. And I, I really admire it. And at the same time, I think, I think everybody I spoke to is very emotional. I can't tell you how many people would come up to me just almost busting into tears that, you know, it's, it's not the fact of what the, the fact that she's suffering from it because so many millions do. The fact that, you know, she's got this young family, she's, you know, trying to carry on and, you know, it's, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing what she's, um, the way she's dealt with it, I think. Now we know the, um, the story, so to speak, the backstory, because there was all that odd thing about, you know, is she really ill? How ill is she? Um, what's the situation? Where was William at the service for King Constantine and things like that? A lot of sort of speculation out there. And then there was a lot of nastiness, wasn't there? So um, I think that's that's helped that and made certain people feel quite guilty, I think. Some people say, well, it's all right for them. They've had a lot of, you know, privilege and, and so on. But there, I always argue that theirs is in the public eye. Ours isn't. I mean, you can withdraw and you can... I mean, f people face all kinds of serious illness and bereavement in different ways. And you want to, you know, some people run away from it. Some people uh, cope in a stoic way. Other people get very emotional. And you want to do that privately. Well, there we are. And that's why we've been asking mm. you if you've written to a royal and if they've ever written back. Keep your stories coming in, please. GBviews at gbnews.com. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, some of you, though, have written in to sort of tell the royals off and things. Well, you think you've that one from Beryl, morning. Uh, Beryl, yes. I wrote to uh, Queen Elizabeth warning that Harry's involvement with Meghan Markle would end in tears and begging her to intervene. But what can you do? Yeah. And didn't she write back? What did she say? Uh, well, no, what I wonder... What did she say? That would be too difficult to reply to. Yes, yeah, I think it would. Mm. But, you know, you're right to write, as it were. Well, that's absolutely... I think we've got a right to write. Yes, we have. Yes. Mm. 11 minutes past eight. Uh, now, how about this one? Espionage fears have taken over Westminster. Uh, there's a small group of MPs who've now been summoned over fears of new wave of state-backed interference. Uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden, is expected to tell Parliament tomorrow that Beijing is behind a string of recent cyber attacks on MPs and peers. Now, amongst those summoned to this meeting include Sir Ian Duncan-Smith, 
former Tory minister Tim Loughton, crossbench peer Lord Alton and SNP MP Stuart Macdonald. Well, let's talk to political commentator Charlie Downs, who's here in the studio. Good morning. What Good do we morning. know about all of this? So, there's a, this is, I think this reflects a broader shift in the mood of Western governments in their approach to China. Because just recently in America, we saw Victoria Newland, a famous Russia hawk, replaced with Kurt Campbell, who is a lifelong China hawk. Um, so, I think that this, this says a lot about the, uh, the changing attitude of Western governments towards China. And now we're seeing this reflected in our country. I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of conversation recently about banning TikTok. Um, and other uh, sort of uh, essentially an arm of the Chinese state because if you think that TikTok is not effectively run by the Chinese Communist Party then you're, you're kidding yourself they have their fingers in every single business that comes out of that country um, do you think I mean it's interesting that these uh, particular characters have been called to the meet this meeting and we don't know what they're going to be told mm. maybe they have been hacked or something like mm. that um, but it just makes you wonder whether our MPs and peers are fully up to date with how much they should be wary mm -hmm. I think that it it's, it's really concerning, to be honest, because I don't... I'm not particularly reassured, personally. I don't think that our government really is on top of this issue, to be honest. I mean, I was reading a story before we came on about China possibly being able to disrupt uh, electric cars, being able to stop them mm. in the middle of the road. Mm. Um, and the reason for this, of course, is because we've outsourced so much of our manufacturing to China. Um, and that is part of a broader conversation that I think we're, is, is long overdue in the West, in our country in particular. The fact that we don't make anything here anymore. We've outsourced so much of our crucial manufacturing to a country that we regard as an enemy. Yes, but a lot of that is down to that, because it's down to chips and all that mm -hmm. sort of technology, which are built with what you call... Oh, it gets complicated. Rare earth metals. Yes. A lot of which are based in China mm. or in Africa, where China has the rights mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. buy them. So there's no way round it. We can't start producing our own silicon chips and all the rest of it because we, we haven't got the basic raw materials. Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty rough situation to be in as a country, aren't we? You know? Yeah, but we must have the scientists who'd be able to tell when we you know, buy in our mobile phones or all the bits that go in them or in electric cars. We must have scientists who can monitor these things and make sure that they are independently working and not functional by <laughs> dint of China. One would hope, but I think something that China are very good at as a state is projecting an image of just being all powerful. I mean, we don't know. We, this, is, this is the problem. We don't know the extent to which they can meddle and disrupt the technology that we've bought from them. Yeah. I would, but do we have a danger of slipping into conspiracy with all of this, though? Because we can all have a panic. I mean, this is a, this is a Chinese phone. Mm -hmm. Am I going to then panic that everything that I do on this phone is going to be monitored by someone in Beijing? Well, I mean, they're welcome to it, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. But, you know, we, we've, we've got to be a bit careful, haven't we, that we just don't all panic. But I think that's part of the strategy. I think the, the not knowing is, is a very conscious decision by the Chinese because what we have to... I think what we have to respect about the Chinese is that they are operating at a level that, that we are just not, you know, in terms of strategy, in terms of long-term planning. Because the problem with our government is that we think in such short time spans, short mm. time horizons, we have such, such a short time preference. We think in terms of election cycles, whereas the Chinese, they're thinking in terms of decades, 25-year plans, 100-year plans. And that comes as a function of their, their political system, which, whether you like it or not, seems to be extremely effective. What do you think these MPs are going to be told? That they've been hacked? I mean, what, what's that meeting about, do you think? I, I think that it's going to be... I think the atmosphere in that room is going to be one of panic, honestly, because for the reasons that I've just laid out, which is we don't know. And that paranoia that it induces is part of the strategy. Oh, oh well, Charlie, bringer <laughs> of doom and gloom. <laughs> Good to see you this yes, morning. Yes, thank Cheers. you very much. Gosh. Yeah, look, we, we certainly need to be on our guard. We need to be careful. I'm very dubious about things like TikTok. Well, why did you buy a Chinese phone, then? Because I don't believe that every, everything manufactured in China is necessarily built with the purpose of monitoring us. You don't know, though, do you? No, you don't. Well, of course you don't know, but then, what? you know, most of our other phones are either made in California, what do the Americans do, or in South Korea, you know, Samsung and all that, all South Korean. A lot of these goods are, you know... So we're going to panic about everything we buy from that part of the world. Conspiracy or complacency? Ooh, ooh, that's interesting. Mm. That's interesting. But then, as I say... Have we, have, we, have we sleepwalked into this? But, you know, if you've got an Android phone, which most people in the world have got Android, um, then um, Google's monitoring everything you do anyway. Do we need to panic about that? Well, some would say yes. But I'm, uh, I've got too, much other, too many other things to worry about than whether 
Google's following me as I drive to work. Yes, but it's not about you, isn't it? It's about the fact that a phone like that, you know, that you obviously found very attractive enough to buy at an extortionate price. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> um, but you know, uh, you know, other people, like people who run countries, will... Well, yes, but, like but they should have all that stuff. That, that's where they do need to be mm. careful, and they should mm. be sort of monitored and safeguarded and not quite air-blocked, but near enough, you know, to make sure that nothing can be done. But that's a different kettle of fish, I think. Yes. We should make our own British phones for ministers. <laughs> what would they look like? We'd go back to the big bricks yeah. again. British they? phones for yeah. British ministers, that yeah. would be the way. Maybe that's what they'll be told. Anyway, talking things extremely British, today marked 80 years since one of the most famous events in the Second World War, the Great Escape. Allies, being kept in a prisoner of war camp in Germany, devised an elaborate plan, I'm sure you know it, oh. to dig tunnels beneath the prison to try and break free. Well, our reporter Will Hollis has been meeting some of the people marking the anniversary in Britain and overseas. During the Second World War, hundreds of thousands on both sides were taken captive as prisoners of war. British prisoners and their allies believed breaking out was their duty. The German camp Stalag Luft III was designed to make that impossible. The story of an attempt 80 years ago today stands out against all others. The Great Escape. At Eden Camp in Moulton, North Yorkshire, the Modern History Museum is showing visitors how they did it. The Allies worked in tight, cramped conditions, digging three tunnels beneath the prison. You can only imagine what conditions were like deep underground, working in the dark, with discovery only a simple mistake away. A team working alongside the museum recreated the escape tunnel and the tools made to dig it. Summer O'Brien is the collections manager at the museum. The prisoners were very creative with what they did, so they made things such as this. So this is a spade and they would have used their everyday items and their rations that they received to create items such as this. Same as the tunnel, they used their bed slats. 76 prisoners got out before discovery. Only three avoided recapture. On Hitler's orders, 50 escapees were killed, a war crime. At the International Bomber Command Center in Lincoln, the names of 28 of them are remembered on its memorial wall, including Canadian Gordon Kidder and Britain Thomas Kirby Green. There they were, escaped together, recaptured, murdered together, and remembered together. Bob Ankerson is president of the RAF's XPOW Association and a volunteer at the center. Captured during the First Gulf War, he later met men from the Great Escape. For those who escaped multiple times, they would be in solitary confinement for a significant length of time. But it didn't dull their determination to continue with their fight. A memorial is held at the tunnel site on the anniversary of the escape in Zhargan, what is now Poland, every year. Marek Lazarz is director of a museum at the site. As a historian, uh, it is our duty to remember every, every anniversary of the Great Escape. The escape is celebrated in the classic 1963 film, with added drama for the cinema sometimes criticised. The true story, unchanged each year, is great enough. Will Hollis, GB News. Oh, a wonderful, wonderful story, mm. a, a true story. I mean, some of the characters were slightly changed in the movie to make room for Steve McQueen, um, who was an absolute <laughs> hero of the movie. Yeah, well, but, yes. I mean, wasn't he? But, but ne nevertheless, the, most of the characters were absolutely true, and um, what happened to them, also true. Absolutely. It's, a, it's a, an amazing movie as well, because it's become a Christmas movie. Yeah, well, these ones often do. It's mm. a bit like that Bruce Willis one, uh, Die Hard. Die Hard, yeah. Die Hard's a Christmas got, I movie. I mean, got very little to do with Christmas at all. No. And, of course, the, the real story of what happened um, for the great escapees um, was, was hardly happy. No. Um, but, uh, but it's something that means a lot to us, I think. Yeah. Well, let's talk to CEO of International Bomber Command Centre, Nicky van der Drift. Good to see you this morning. How important is it that we remember this incredible story all these years on? Uh, good morning. Uh, well, it was the most auditious uh, prison escape in history. Um, and as, as Will mentioned in his piece, you know, they really felt it was their duty to do this um, at great risk. And it's important that we remember every 
uh, sacrifice and service that was made during that time. Yeah, as you said, that comes across very much so in the movie, doesn't it? That um, they all saw it as their duty um, to not just sit back and be prisoners of war, but to disrupt the enemy as much as they possibly could by continuously trying to escape. Absolutely. It, it pulled resources away from, from front line. Um, it obviously frustrated the Germans uh, regionally, but also nationally. Um, and it, it was really important that they did what they could to get back. Nevertheless, when they were chased down, I mean, after that remarkable escape, escape, when they were chased down, they shouldn't have been shot. That was a war crime. But they were apparently on Hitler's personal orders. Absolutely. He was furious about um, this escape, bearing in mind that Stalag Luft III was built specially to house those that had been regular escapees from other camps. Um, and I, I think he took it as a great affront uh, to their security. And he gave the Gestapo orders to uh, make an example of the 50. Mm. But in, in a sense, it just seems to be... I mean, I know it's, it's glamorised by the movie, in a sense, which is what most of us reflect on, but it does seem this incredible bit of Britishness, of, of, of spirit that we, we don't seem to have anymore. Uh, well, I, ca I can't comment on whether we have it because they're not tested in the same way um, mm. as they were there. There was a collective move to support um, and protect our freedom. Um, and we don't know until we're tested in a similar way whether this generation you know, would stand up in the same way. If you ask many of the bomber veterans, they, they believe they would. Wow. Uh, and they were so resourceful. I mean, the things we just saw very um, briefly in that clip there, the things they were able to make and build in order to, to dig those tunnels, and they made them out of things that, I mean, you just can't imagine um, how they did it, but they did, and they, and they created um, their, their disguises and passports uh, in the most remarkable way. Absolutely. We, uh, we worked very closely with uh, Air Commodore uh, Charles Clark, who was the uh, president of uh, the association that Robert now uh, heads. And his memory of it was that he climbed into bed one day and fell through because all the struts from his bed had been removed. Um, and, and literally, it was everything had a secondary purpose. Yeah. Um, just while we've got you... Um, I just wanted your views on, um, as your International Bomber Command Centre, uh, on the Lancaster Bomber Memorial that's meant to rival the Angel of the North uh, on the Lincolnshire, Nottinghamshire border that they're, they're trying to raise more money for at the moment. It looks like it's going to be an incredible structure uh, when they get it up next year. How important will it be? It's fantastic. You know, Lincolnshire is Bomber County and it, it is a gateway into what we do so brilliantly, you know, that the heritage of Bomber Command and a lot of the RAF is based in that county. So what a welcome. And it will work in exactly the same way as the Angel of the North. You know, you're in the northeast now um, and this will be welcome to Lincolnshire. It's really important. Yeah, it yeah is. fantastic. Nikki van der Drift, really good to see you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Lovely. 80 years ago, the greatest game. Phenomenal, isn't it? Isn't it? it? Talking of dates, I didn't mention it yesterday. Yesterday was the fourth anniversary of the first lockdown. Wow. Which is... That four, fourth anniversary? Yeah. Gosh. Where's the time? I don't Where's know. the time gone? I don't, I don't know, know, because to me it seems like a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's just flying by. And you look really. back and you think, my goodness, that happened in this country. Yeah. It was four years ago it, yesterday. We, we changed the way we lived entirely, those mm. lockdowns. It's incredible, isn't it? Uh, amazing to think about. Anyway, we won't be locked down this summer, fingers crossed, so you could be out in the garden enjoying a whole bevy of treats thanks to our great British Spring giveaway. You can have tech, garden treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash. It's quite a prize. Here's how you can make it yours.
there's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Good luck. And if you don't want your garden pizza oven... I'll have you know, it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Just look at it then as this spins round and think, ooh, yeah. that'd be nice. It'd be lovely to be sitting in the garden. Lovely day. And just cook something and eat pizza fresh from the oven straight away. That's how you should eat it. You know, when the cheese is still bubbling. I'm starving now. Nice. <laughs> oh, anyway. Get one. All right, still to come. As we come to the end of Shakespeare Week... Yes, it's been Shakespeare Week. <laughs> And we'll be looking at why the Bard's work now comes with trigger warnings. Or sooth. <laughs> That's next. This is GB News. Britain's news channel. Yeah, well, when it comes to fish and chips, we all know they're a part of a British tradition and the Golden Chippy is, is an award-winning uh, restaurant and for years they've been serving the community here in Greenwich and even today on a Sunday they are fully packed today but this is the issue here we've got a mural and which says a great British meal residents who live in this area who've complained uh, to Greenwich Council who say it's inappropriate uh, considering it's in a conservation area here's what some of the local people we've been speaking to had to say What's wrong with it? It looks all right, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? Look at some of the other they've got around in Greenwich. They don't want to take that down, do they? But when you've got something like this, it's half day, so they want to remove it. Fantastic artwork. I really like it. Reminds me of Banksy. Well, those are the views here from people who live in this local area. But I'm kindly joined by Chris, the owner. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. You've been here for 20 years now. Um, tell, tell me how this issue has come up. They take pictures. It's only been up for about a month. And uh, it's been very, very popular. I don't want to believe that any of the locals are uh, complaining that this is uh, too loud or anything like that. They say it's, it needs planning permission. How a little thing like this needs planning permission, I don't know. Are you working with an artist in this local area? I've got a local uh, guy that uh, does uh, murals, so he said, uh, would you like me to do something for you? I said, yes, why not? I said, make sure you leave a bit of space for people to stand there so they can uh, take some selfies or pictures or whatever they want to do from Golden Chippy. And it's been extremely popular, and not one person has come to me and said, that looks terrible. So I cannot imagine the person that complained about this. I think it's just cancelled. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel.
Now, did you know... Oh, no. ..that this week, yes, has been Shakespeare week? No idea. No, I think it missed me, too. But um, schools up and down the country have been getting involved in activities to learn more about Britain's most celebrated bard. Are there any other bards? No, I think he must be the world's biggest bard. Only bard? Hmm. I don't know what a bard is, but anyway. But as children learn about his play, some theatres have giving, given audiences... Oh, wait for it. Trigger warnings ahead of performances, informing them about themes like violence, racism and misogyny. Well, that's why he wrote about it, isn't it? Uh, yes. Uh, our West Midlands reporter Jack Carson reports. Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown, but for William Shakespeare, retaining his status as Britain's most celebrated bard has been seemingly light work. 1,700 of the words he invented are still part of our language today, and this week has all been about continuing that legacy within the community. Shakespeare Week is celebrating a decade of giving primary school aged children opportunities to enrich themselves in the work of the man from Stratford. As Charlotte Scott, director of knowledge at the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust explains. Well, the last 10 years have been spectacular as we started to grow a programme that was really about creating an incredibly positive experience for children to access Shakespeare where language isn't a barrier, where it's fun, where it's playful and over the last 10 years that programme has grown. I think what's important as well is that we allow children to explore some of those adult themes in ways that they are informed and enabled so that they can still encounter uh, ideas that are related to the adult world but in safe spaces and in ways that are inclusive and imaginative. More recently, adult themes within Shakespeare have been the topic of debate, with both actor Ray Fiennes and Culture Secretary Lucy Fraser calling for an end of the increasing number of trigger warnings on the Bard's plays. Fiennes says people should be shocked and disturbed by the theatre, but what do those in Shakespeare's hometown of Stratford make of the recent trend? Uh, I think that's an overreaction. No need for it at all. Absolutely ridiculous. You just have to understand how the world was when those plays and works were written. Um, there was no offence meant, it was just how it was. And you can't rewrite history. The woke brigade spoiling everything. I think that's a good idea because things have changed, standards have improved, values have improved. So, yeah, let's not offend. To warn or not to warn? That is the question. But Shakespeare Week has opened the door for the next generation to continue the Bard's everlasting legacy. Jack Carson, GB News, Stratford-upon-Avon. Oh, well, get a grip. What do you think of that? Get a grip. Mm. I mean, it's ridiculous. We'll be putting trigger warnings ahead of episodes of Blue Peter next. Yes, that's right. Yes. In case Where, you don't... Sticky back plastic. Sticky back Quick. plastic, yeah. You may be allergic to... You know, it's, it just gets ridiculous. Mm. You know, and if you don't like something, don't go and see it. You know, if it's... You know, oh. yeah, but the question is, you know, should you just know what it's about before you go and see it so that you're... Well, you have a rough idea. Mm. I mean, you know it's not a modern piece. Yeah, and if you're going to see a Shakespeare play, surely you've shown some interest already. Yeah, crazy. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to... You, you lose track of Shakespeare a bit as you're getting older, but, I mean, I went to see one or two local performances when I was a youngster, mm. you know, and doing, doing me A-levels and things. It's, it's incredible work. Oh, we used to live but, very yeah. near Stratford. It was an absolute treat going to... Going to going into the theatre and actually seeing somebody... Did you go to the actual Royal Shakespeare yeah, whatnot? Yeah, 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 just on the river there. It's absolutely beautiful. Oh, nice. But, you know, people, it's, it, that's like... It, it's nice when there are sort of occasionally... You, you're reminded to go when there's a famous name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we went to see David Tennant in Hamlet. Oh, you know, did you? And, um, and who's Captain Jean-Luc Picard. Uh, Patrick Stewart. Yeah, he was something and something when we went to see that. And, and, and then you wait at the stage door afterwards... Um, did you? ..for an uh, autograph, yeah. Yeah, and they're still up on the wall, you know, autographed photographs. I can't imagine like you that. hanging around a stage door. Well, I've got four, so, four sons with me. They all wanted David Tennant's autograph, Patrick Stewart's autograph. Oh, yeah. yeah, so we went round oh, to I'd the stage Pat door. I'd want Patrick Stewart's autograph. Yeah, no, no, it was brilliant. So that's why I think they, you know, they drag in a famous name every so often to sort of get people up and going and mm. out to see a bit of Shakespeare. It was lovely. Um, loads of you getting in touch about the roles. I love this one from David who says, uh, Prince Charles gave me my first pint of beer mm. when I was about eight years old. Wow, that's an early start. I was bush beating at Nickerson's Farm in Lincolnshire when he came to the back of the beater's cart, produced a crate of beer, cracked it open and passed me a can. And he said, don't tell your mum. 
<laughs> I think that's really sweet, actually. I really like that. And there'll be some people now up in arms about that. Oh, absolutely. I used to get bottles of... Uh, every Christmas, we got bottles of woodpecker cider from Grandma when we were four or five. Really? Yeah, you'd have, a, you'd have a glass of cider on Christmas Day and all that sort of thing. i tell you what, is. we've got some more of your pictures you've been oh. sending in as well. Because we've been asking all morning you know, about uh, whether you've written to any royal and whether they've ever written back. David sent this. He says, this letter was sent to my grandmother when my grandfather died in 1916, signed by King George. The letter read, I join with my grateful people in sending you this memorial of a brave life given for others in the Great War. I love that. That's beautiful. Isn't that? Isn't well, that and I can something? see you've got it framed. And oh. quite right, too. I mean, that's a little piece of history, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Tom from Bury St Edmunds uh, says, I have many letters from the royal family. My most treasured is a handwritten letter by Princess Margaret thanking me after I photographed her and her family in 1969. Oh, and that's a lovely photograph as well, isn't it? It's a great picture. Yeah. Oh. Someone's saying it looks like Charlotte and George. It does a little well, bit. it does. Royal to children do tend to look very similar, though, when they're little, don't they? I yeah, don't I know suppose, why. It's because of what they I, wear and the way they have their hair cut. And I should say, a certain Ms Susan Holder and Mr... Oh, yes. Mr, Mr. Noddy, Noddy Holder mm. um, have uh, sent, in, sent to me uh, a picture that they received from um, the King and Queen... Uh, because they wrote to them after he revealed his cancer diagnosis. Of course, I mean, Noddy had uh, has recently revealed that he had cancer. Yeah. So there's all that sort of interconnection. Anyway, they've got a lovely card and picture back. Very nice. Yes. Oh, isn't that lovely? Well, these things are... Actually, Anne, morning Anne, has put in touch saying, I have a friend who worked closely with Queen Elizabeth and is Ooh. still employed by the royal family. She assures me that everything is read, every card and letter that is sent. Acknowledgements of some kind are sent back wherever a reply address is given. Mm. Isn't that lovely? There you go. Uh, right, we've got the sport heading away very shortly. Aidan? Yeah, we'll be finding out who exactly fluffed their lines in an England shirt last night at Wembley as Brazil prevailed in an international friendly. And it was a surprise at the Australian Grand Prix. Max Verstappen crashing out. More after the break. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. 
That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Time for the sport with Mr. Aidan McGee. Good to see you both. Bit of yes. tennis. Oh, absolutely. We mentioned retirement earlier on, didn't we? Well, we've been what talking is... a lot about retirement. Um, and um, Andy Murray, who a lot of people thought might retire... Um, has, Probably five is, years ago, yeah. Well, he's right through to the round three of the um, Miami, Miami Open. Open. He is, yeah. Look, it's, it's what hard. number is, does he rank in the world? 566 on February the 24th. Uh, so that's... that's what, a month ago, with this victory, they might take him up the rankings. But what that means, in effect, Han, is that wherever you go, you're not going to get easy draws, no, which is not. why in the second round he's faced the world number 27. Uh, Thomas Martin Echeverry, who beat him, actually, at the Australian Open back Yeah, but he beat him this time. He did, indeed, yeah. It was some, some measure of, uh, of revenge. But I think the spell of injury probably reignited his, his appetite for tennis. He did say on the Graham Norton show maybe ten years ago that after winning that first Wimbledon, because it, that, that was the holy grail for so long, not just for him, but for, but for so many other British players over the last 30, 40, 50 years, that he lost a little bit of desire. He was happy to just rest on his laurels. You can, you can understand that. Mm. Then the injury took, took hold. He did win another one, didn't he, at Wimbledon in 2016, three years later. But I wonder if that just intensified or, intensified or reignited his, his... or replenished his appetite for competition, because it's not like he's just taking part in exhibition matches or invitationals on his doorstep. I mean, he's, travel he's travelling to Miami, I presume he's looking to compete in... He may I mean, he, he may miss the, the clay court season, I don't know, just because of the injury situation with his hip. But uh, he's showing no sign of abating at the moment. And he won his straight sets uh, yesterday. And there's some well, big beasts that's... still left in the, in my, mm. in the, in the Miami Open, but Novak Djokovic is, uh, has pulled out because he wants to manage his schedule a bit more. And I imagine it's just... You know, he, he'll, he'll happily go to a five-setter. Anywhere he goes. But isn't you know? it interesting that having been number one, he's not too grand to be to be no, ranked so much no, lower no, no, down and still do the. Oh, I bet it grates with him. Do no, think... I don't think it does because I don't. Because oh. well, maybe he's maybe, doing it, isn't he? Maybe, maybe because maybe. Some, sometimes <laughs> so, sometimes you normally you'd expect a wild card, wouldn't you? Yeah. Into into especially into major major tournaments. Miami is quite a major one. It's not one of the grand slams, but it's one of the one of the next. The it's next an important group. one, yeah. Exactly, and so he's going. He's he's going on. I think it's uh, tomorrow. He's in action. And, um, you know, we'll see how he gets on. But as I say, he looks in really decent form uh, at the moment. And let's see how long he can go oh, for. 566 in a while. He's 37. He's 37 in May. Oh, right. Well, that, yeah, that's too, still too young to retire, really. Yeah, it though. is. All oh, talking about being young. Mm. Endrick. Yes, 17 years old. Yeah. So he would have been... He would only been about five when Andy Murray won his first, won his first Grand Slam. Mm. And he was the young man who scored the winning goal for Brazil. Quite late last on night. last night. Yeah, so it was... I mean, he's actually already signed to Real Madrid for next, next year, so they're getting younger and younger, it seems. But he's obviously a prodigious talent because they've scouted him in South America and he looks an outstanding uh, player. He was quite, quite a fortunate goal. He's knocked it into the net. It was a bit of a mistake by the England uh, defence, a bit of lax uh, marking. But I have to say, you've, you know, when you're given an opportunity in the absence of key players, and you really have to step up to the... And our players last night just didn't do that. Ollie Watkins was given a big opportunity last well, night he to start. It, didn't he? he did. He got the he got the whole. Um, I think he got the whole ninety minutes. He certainly played most of the, most of the game. One big chance in the first first half. Ivan Tony is also twenty eight, and it, there's there's going to be one space alongside Harry Kane. I think on the plane to Germany three months time. It's not as if we're looking two years ahead here. It's pretty much on the horizon. And so Ivan Tony, they're against Brent, they're against uh, Belgium rather on uh, on Tuesday at Wembley. And he'll be looking to stake his claim. And I think if that's all he's got to beat last night... And this is a player that Ollie Watkins has scored 16 goals and set up 10 this season. So I think Ivan Tony will look at that last night. And it'll be a, if he does make the plane, Ivan Tony, that's, a bit, that's quite a remarkable recovery. He was yeah, banned yeah. for eight, eight months, wasn't he? Yeah. He only came back at Christmas. He's scored four goals since then. But you look at the other rest of the England, England side. I mean, Kyle Walker damaged the hamstring. That's a worry for Manchester City on the running of the, for the Premier League. Harry Maguire wasn't particularly outstanding, despite, despite his renaissance for Manchester United recently. Lewis Dunk wasn't particularly impressive off the bench. And the, the 
the debutants did okay, though, I have to say. Kobe Mainu, uh, Esri Konsa and uh, Anthony Gordon. So, so it comes with comfort back out yeah. at Southgate, but not a lot more. We're being yelled at because we're out of time. I know. Uh, Aidan, I know. So we're going to have to go. Ah. Thank you very much indeed. But talk, just very briefly, we're talking to retirements. Rod said he didn't retire until he was 76. Still misses working, but he now spends his time singing and recording songs. And he calls himself the singing pensioner mm. on YouTube. So we've been having a look at your work. There you go, Rod. Brilliant. Really good. Well very done. nice. Like that very much indeed. We'll listen to that in the break, Rod. Ah. Uh, come back with us. We've got the papers in a couple of minutes. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Yeah, well, when it comes to fish and chips, we all know they're a part of a British tradition and the Golden Chippy is, is an award-winning uh, restaurant. And for years, they've been serving the community here in Greenwich. And even today, on a Sunday, they are fully packed today. But this is the issue. Here we've got a mural and which says a great British meal. Residents who live in this area who've complained uh, to Greenwich Council who say it's inappropriate uh, considering it's in a conservation area. Here's what some of the local people we've been speaking to had to say. What's wrong with it? It looks all right, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? Look at some of the other feet you've got around in Greenwich. They don't want to take that down, do they? But when you've got something like this, it's half day, so they want to remove it. Fantastic artwork. I really like it. Reminds me of Banksy. Well, those are the views here from people who live in this local area. But I'm kindly joined by Chris, the owner. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. You've been here for 20 years now. Um, tell, tell me how this issue has come up. They take pictures. It's only been up for about a month. And uh, it's been very, very popular. I don't want to believe that any of the locals are uh, complaining that this is uh, too loud or anything like that. They say... It's, it needs planning permission. How a little thing like this needs planning permission, I don't know. Are you working with an artist in this local area? I've got a local uh, guy that uh, does uh, murals, so he said, uh, would you like me to do something for you? I said, yes, why not? I said, make sure you leave a bit of space for people to stand there so they can uh, take some selfies or pictures or whatever they want to do from Golden Chippy. And it's been extremely popular, and not one person has come to me and said, that looks terrible. So I cannot imagine the person that complained about this. I think it's just cancel. Good morning, 8.49. Should we see what's um, making the papers this morning uh, with uh, George Frost and Fraser Myers? Morning to you both. Well, Morning. all the front pages are still Princess Catherine, but looking at a few other stories, um, this one's absolutely fascinating, Georgia. You found it in The Observer. The playground bullies, those horrible kids you had to endure mm. at school, mm. earn more money in middle age. Isn't that depressing? Yes. Mm. <laughs> so what do we do? Do we encourage all our children to be bullies? No, we absolutely don't. This is a five-decade study finding aggression at school can lead to later success at work. Uh, they obviously found those who were disengaged in school, etc., didn't do so well, but the thing that surprised them the most was this. So maybe that kind of pushy, bolshy, slightly aggressive manner is what's got them this far. However, it does go on to say 
don't encourage your children to be bullies <laughs> because actually the change in the workplace since sort of the Me Too movement and 2016 and that sort of thing has uh, gone for a softer approach, Well, maybe. I guess you could argue they might earn more money in middle age, but they're not necessarily happier, are they? I mean, I'm, I'm hoping. What was I going to say? Let's hope so. There's always this idea that, you know, oh, the bully is themselves in emotional pain and that's why they, they mm. lash out. I just wonder, if is that just something we tell ourselves as a sort of coping me mechanism? I wonder. To tell, you know, the world isn't as nice as we think because you know everyone's had a I assume everyone has had like a mm. nasty manager so it must mm. be you imagine they would have been a playground bully at I do know the nasty nasty managers I've had I always think they were probably bullied at school mm. well, you, you would think that wouldn't mm. you well, but yeah. they didn't often that's what you're told or you're led to believe I can see it they though, didn't follow it. this up and, and check whether they were aggressive and bullying now though yeah so they may have learnt from that early experience but who knows that's yeah. uh, for another study maybe well, you've got to hope so, though. You've got to hope so. Um, Fraser, um, <laughs> Just Stop Oils. <laughs> I mean, the, the idiots in Just Stop Oil, um, they're, they're too white and too middle class, apparently. But we've noticed they have very posh names. They're very posh. They, they do, yes. Yeah, so someone called Olive uh, from Just Stop Oil has... Uh, She's a Just Stop Oil activist. She's saying some home truths to them, that we're too white, we're too uh, middle class. As you said, everyone else has noticed that. Um, you know, the, just the names are a big giveaway. Uh, famous Just Stop Oil activists mm. include Indigo Rumbelow, That's right. Amy <laughs> Ruggiezy, Cressida Gethin. You know, they just... Really? Yeah, they're I mean, not ordinary working class people. Yeah, they, you'll be shocked to hear that they're not. And I, I think this isn't really a question of messaging and tactics. I do just think that the extreme eco-activism is only really going to attract posh people because it is a kind of class war in a sense. You know, well, then it's, it's a it's job. A, it's a job. No one else can afford to spend true. tech all the time off to go and spray paint. And it is an attack on ordinary working people's lives. You know, they're against mass travel, uh, nor ordinary, you know, cars, mm -mm -mm. the way people you, you, um, mm. uh, get around much. You know, they're in favour of higher energy bills, and that's, you know, destructive to industry, destructive to people's pay packets. So there is an inherent class dynamic to this that is mm. not going to be circumvented by better messaging. Yeah. Now, we've only got a couple of minutes and we've got to see the next video that's sort of gone viral, Georgie. Tell us about it first, set it up for us. But it's oh, something to do with an elephant. A safari. I don't know if you've ever been on a safari yeah. in South Africa. Well, no, I've been, no, I've been to a safari park. <laughs> you might think twice yeah. after watching this video, and I will leave it at that, because I thought, oh, elephant, da 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 So this, happened, this happened where? It was at the... Um, no, I don't know where, actually. It must have been on safari. On safari actually, in South in Africa. Africa somewhere. So in let's South have Africa. a look at the video now. This is what happened when a very large elephant decided it didn't like the truck coming towards it, carrying tourists. At which point I would uh, speedily go into reverse. Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, I mean, you have to say I don't. I sort of think, well, I don't blame the. A bit later really, on but... in that video clip that's got it's gone viral, so you'll find it very easily. The um, you see it from the tourist perspective. Mm. Somebody must have got their phone out, mm. and this is an enormous elephant, and it is clearly capable of lifting the truck up and just sort of flinging it away. I think they got away lightly with that very. one. Goodness me! It reminded me of the backlot tram tour at Universal Studios. <laughs> oh, <laughs> where. Oh, animatronic things pick up the truck. And it's just as terrifying. It's just as terrifying, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. Well, it's the power of nature. Don't want to mess with elephants. No, certainly not. Should not have given them a pedalo. <laughs> like the bears in Wales and Park. It was more fun, yeah. Um, although we haven't got time to discuss it. Real men don't eat oats for breakfast, according to Georgie. No, have your bacon salami. It's oats. just another study that's looking at the way men and women eat, and it's exactly how you would imagine. Women eat chocolates, apparently. We eat more, we snack well, more, and men, perfect. you know, as you would imagine. What you would expect. <laughs> Thanks both. Here's your weather. Looks like things are heating up. Box spoilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Sunday promises to be a much quieter day weather-wise across the UK than on Saturday, drier, brighter and less blustery too. 
There are still one or two showers around today, particularly toward the north of Scotland. Uh, still wintry across the hilltops there, but elsewhere the winds, as I say, are much lighter, more in the way of sunshine around. Any showers very isolated, and with that extra bit of sunshine and the winds being that much lighter too, it should feel a bit warmer than on Saturday. Temperatures peaking in the south and southeast at around about 12 or 13 Celsius. 13 there in London is 55 in Fahrenheit, near average towards the north at 8 to 11 Celsius. As we go through the evening, we'll start to see some outbreaks of rain working their way in from the west, pushing in across parts of Northern Ireland and other westernmost areas. Whereas uh, towards the north and east, as we go through Sunday night, we'll hold on to some clearer conditions. Here it will turn quite chilly, at least for a time, because of a touch of frost here. Whereas out towards the west, that cloud, wind and rain will start to lift temperatures. And by the morning on Monday, temperatures uh, in Belfast, for example, will be around 6 Celsius, 43 in Fahrenheit. That sets the scene for a bit of an east-west split in our weather on Monday. Wet at times, fairly blustery conditions developing out towards the west. Some quite heavy bursts of rain at times. We do hold on to sunnier skies towards the north and east, with some cloud gradually pushing in there as we go through the day from the west. But in the best of that sunshine, and with the wind staying fairly light out towards the east, temperatures will climb into double figures, but feeling cooler with that wind and rain out towards the west. That's it. See you soon. Bye-bye. That warm feeling inside from Box Spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax free cash. Text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Now, what's going on in Scotland? So they're implementing these draconian hate speech laws, which are going to come in, into force on April the 1st, I kid you oh, not. Ironically, yeah. And then, um, basically, you can go to your local mushroom shop or whatever. Which I didn't know we had mushrooms farms in Scotland, no. because people aren't that keen on vegetables up the road. They're, they're... Um, <laughs> but, not even a shiitake. Um, but you can report a hate crime at these private places, but you can do it anonymously, and then the police will, uh, I don't know, unleash the hate monster. I, I don't know what, how this works. What's going on? I think the hate monster... <laughs> is mythical, yes. and um, I don't think the hate monster actually exists. What I do think is existed. I'm genuinely really worried about comedy, right? Yeah. Now, believe it or not, some people in Scotland, they're wrong, but they don't like me. Yeah. And I genuinely feel that a lot of time is going to be wasted. You know, if someone yeah. calls you a name in a shop, you probably mm. deserved it, believe me. Um, also, I've comedy can be quite offensive, particularly yours. And I'm not necessarily sure. As I've said on the show before, I remember my mum was worried when we, we, Scotland had decided that all um, residential properties needed special smoke alarms, and my mum was convinced this was to do with the hate crime and that there was a camera in them. I, 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 I don't think she's being that paranoid. I mean, it, Scotland is a kind of nanny state. You know, actually, Hamza Youssef, when he implemented the hate crime bill, put a, a subsection in that which said that they can criminalise you for things you've said in the privacy of your own home. Thankfully, Scotland doesn't have the largest arts festival in the world. Oh, wait, oh, no, it does, it does. It actually does have that. And lots of comedians are up there. Now, we had this before, because if you go back about to, uh, to 2000 and, what was it, 2003, when New Labour were trying to push through their racial and religious hate crime bill, well, the comedians are silent now. Something has completely changed. There's been a gear shift. Oh, I mean, in the Irish hate crime bill, which is, which is going through at the moment, they actually define hatred as hatred. Brilliant. It's a complete circular definition. Well, well, yeah, well, absolutely. And that tells me, when something's woolly, that tells me that it's not going to be applied fairly. It's going to be applied according to the person applying it. Good morning. It's nine o'clock on Sunday, the 24th of March. Today, Kensington Palace has revealed the Princess of Wales is enormously touched by the outpouring of support following her cancer diagnosis.
The Russian President Vladimir Putin has declared a day of mourning following the deaths of some 143 people, we think, in a Moscow terrorist attack. He's also made unsubstantiated claims that Ukraine was involved. There are claims that China has been targeting senior politicians at Westminster through a string of cyber attacks as three senior MPs and a member of the House of Lords are called to an urgent meeting. And today marks 80 years since one of the most famous events of the Second World War, The Great Escape, made famous, of course, by the 1963 movie. We'll be looking at how the anniversary is being marked across Bomber Country or Bomber County, Lincolnshire. Hello, today looks much quieter weather-wise across the UK than on Saturday. There'll be more in the way of sunshine around and lighter winds too. And with those lighter winds, it should feel a bit warmer. I'll have all the details a little bit later. Morning to you, I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Anne Diamond and this is Breakfast on GB News. So many of you getting in touch with um, messages that you've sent to the royal family. Because it's all about the, the um, Kensington Palace absolutely overwhelmed by the support shown to the Princess of Wales. And, of course, a lot of that will be online at the moment. Um, but, of course, people will be writing. And it means a huge amount, apparently. Um, John's been in touch uh, saying he remembers the 16th of October 1991 because it's the day he was told he had cancer. Um, he loves the, the Queen Mum, so my family wrote to her to ask if she could send a note. And um, a letter arrived at, on my hospital bed saying Her Majesty's brother had the same cancer as me, uh, so she understands it with great sympathy with what she was going through and wished me better. I treasure that letter to this day. So it's huge impact, mm. isn't it? Not only when you write, uh, but when they write back as well. And I think that's a lovely thing, and we're going to be talking... Uh, a little bit later on about all the support that the Princess of Wales and indeed the Prince of Wales have received. Because it's important to remember William in all of this, who's having to be... And the King. ..the rock. And the King and the Queen, mm -hmm. yeah, through all of this. Um, so, uh, reflecting on that a little bit later on. But first of all, let's go uh, look at Russia, where a National Day of Mourning is taking place following that devastating massacre at a concert hall near Moscow on Friday, which killed at least 143 people. Now, despite Islamic State claiming responsibility for the attack, and that seems to have been backed up by the United States as well yesterday, President Putin has suggested that they were all helped by Ukraine. Well, earlier on, we spoke with defence editor of the Evening Standard, Robert Fox. Two strands, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, in this story now. One is the massacre itself, which was terrible, and the number seems to have gone up to 143 mm -hmm. now, with hundreds injured, unspecified numbers. They're probably in a number of, of hospitals. But the other is the false flag argument. This is a political story now which is gathering potency and it is very important. ISK, as it's called, the Islamic State Khorasan, the parts of Afghanistan whence it comes, where it is fighting the Taliban, would you believe it, has form. It's done a lot of things. But also Putin Russia has form with false flag arguments. And a lot of the Russians in exile, the experts have been going through quite a, a lot of their comments just this morning, again, are pointing to the precedence of false flag arguments. And there was one spectacular one in 1999 where um, apartment blocks were blown up in Moscow as Putin himself was moving, follow me, from being prime minister to president for the first time. He's just been re-elected for the fifth time mm. to the headship of government and, 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 and state. He did briefly become prime minister in between. At that time, he launched the second terrible Chechen war. So this was fingered very clearly. It's very interesting for us here in Britain and us here in London by Alexander Litvinenko, uh -huh. who was then killed three years later. So this, what I'm saying is that Putin's argument, which you illustrated here, 
shows the psychological campaign he is going through now. What he's saying to people in Russia, in Moscow in particular, is, I'm still in charge, I'm a big boss, the enemies are all around, my war is right. Mm. Mm. And it's not the war where he is in trouble, by the way, on the Caucasus borders of, of Russia with Islamic fundamentalists who have attacked in Russia and in Iran the new Russian ally. And you can see how complex it's going. Oh. I'm afraid in the psychological war, we're just at the beginning. What he is saying, your security is safe in my hands, mm -hmm. except why didn't the GRU, the FSB, the secret services react sooner? Even the emergency services took nearly two hours to arrive in strength uh, at, at, at the scene. But his message is, I'm the boss, I'm going to make it work for me. Robert Fox talking to us earlier. I mean, with all that going on, there's China espionage claims in Parliament this morning. And, of course, all the reaction uh, to what's happened with uh, the Princess of Wales and the support, which she says she's overwhelmed by it. Um, this is in the Mail on Sunday this morning. I'm so touched by the outpouring of love. It's in all the papers this morning. And quite right, too, that that support is being shown. So there's lots and lots and lots for Camilla Tomini to get her teeth into at half past nine this morning. And she joins us now. Morning, Camilla. And indeed, Camilla, you've written a piece Morning. in this morning's uh, Telegraph um, talking about what has happened to the King and Princess Catherine and how it's going to um, make them even stronger together. Yes, I mean, they're already very close and we've seen that over the course of recent years, haven't we? Because they always greet each other with a greater degree of affection. Obviously, the king is the king to her, but also her beloved father-in-law. And we know now that when they were both in the London clinic together, having their different treatments, uh, in Kate's case for that abdominal surgery, and in the king's case for that enlarged prostate, that he was toddling down the corridor in his dressing ground to go and see her. So I think that they've both taken enormous comfort from each other going through this horrific experience at the same time. I was also told that one of the reasons why the princess decided to do that video message, well, let's be honest, was quite unprecedented. I mean, she hasn't always been the most confident of public speakers. So for her to put herself forward in that very personal way in that video that was recorded last week, I think it was because the King had had such an overwhelmingly positive response to his own cancer diagnosis that she then was able to build up the courage to be that candid with the public. And obviously the results have kind of proved her right. I think William had reservations about her doing it, had been questioning, look, why do you have to put yourself out there in this way, not least after everything that had been put through all of the social media criticism, the conspiracy theories, the false rumours. I think William was a bit nervous on her behalf, but I'm told that she basically got it in her head she wanted to do it, not just because of this idea of timing it so that the children will have been told and then go on their Easter holidays so their parents could shield them a little bit from the public gaze now, but equally because she felt that the response to the King had been so positive that she wanted to be open with the public in support, really, for other people going through cancer as well. I mean, the important thing is, though, now can they put it behind them? I've just been looking... Someone sent me something on Twitter, actually, this morning, highlighting some of the trolling which is going on now, mm. even after the announcement. And it's yeah. absolutely vile. I mean, it's absolutely vitriolic. So you've got to hope that these wicked and evil people can be ignored, frankly, and that now she's said her piece, she's getting support from the vast majority of people, will they be able to just ignore the rest? And, I mean, I really hope so. What is wrong with people? <sighs> Seriously, in light of this diagnosis, you've still got people trolling the Princess of Wales. I think one particular troll has been exposed in the Mail on Sunday this morning. It's just absolutely despicable, isn't it? But at the same time, unfortunately, social media is a sewer and a lot of these keyboard warriors can't be stopped. I mean, they're emboldened by us giving them coverage. I think this tendency for the mainstream media to sort of pick up on criticism on X and other platforms and then amplify it, I don't think we should be doing that. 
that. I don't think we should be giving any credence at all to sort of self-appointed experts on social media that are largely anonymous. They don't know what they're talking about. It's all a vanity project for them. Just ignore them. I mean, obviously, this has generated a huge amount of media coverage, as would be expected of an announcement of this gravitas. It came as an enormous shock even to people like me in the business who've been covering her health story for quite some time. The general public has rightfully kind of reacted with a huge amount of sympathy because she's a very popular member of the royal family. And I think there's rightly admiration for the courage she's shown in how she's presented herself to the public. So, I mean, trolls and these dreadful people, it's just, they shouldn't be given any airtime or credence whatsoever in my mind. I think I think we all agree there, mm. is, and not to let our news agenda be guided by these horrible people no. on um, social media. Um, it's interesting. I mean, obviously, we we know you very much on GB News talking politics, but you have this um, esteemed career as a royal reporter and editor too. Do you have any royal guests on the show today? Well, actually, speaking of royalty, and of course we're going to be addressing the Prince of Princess of Wales story throughout the show. We'll be speaking about it to Martin Townsend, former editor of the Sunday Express in the papers. I've actually just done an interview with the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, which will be playing out on the show. He had to come in for a pre-record because he's got a very busy broadcast round this morning. I've asked him about the cancer diagnosis because, of course, he's experienced cancer in his own family. His brother, Charlie, died of cancer last year. He's running the London Marathon for a cancer challenge. Charity. So I spoke to him about that. And I've got Elsa Anderson talking about it. She's the former press secretary to Queen Elizabeth II. She knows the Princess of Wales well. She knows the royals. And she can also perhaps comment on what it means for the monarchy moving forward. I mean, the person I feel sorry for in all this, apart from Kate, is, of course, Prince William. Imagine, in the last two months, his father's been diagnosed with cancer and now his wife. Yeah, it's, it's an awful lot on his shoulders. And we were saying yesterday, he's going to plough on, he's going to carry on, but it, it won't be until this is over that he'll really feel all that pressure. I hope we give him a bit of a break towards the end of the year, actually, when he'll need that recuperation time. Absolutely. And also, I think this uh, idea of any of them rushing back to work, you know, this is a very serious condition. She's having chemotherapy. Any idea that they have to start appearing at Easter services? If they want to appear at things, they should. But I think everybody now understands this need to prioritise immediate family, their own three children, rather than the so-called family firm. And to be yeah. fair, amid talk of the slimmed-down monarchy, the royals have done quite well. You know, you, as you say there, Stephen, you've had William still carrying out engagements despite everything that's been going on in the background. Queen Camilla... She's been playing a blinder, hasn't she? Mm. We've had other members of the royal family, like Princess Anne, stepping up. So they've kept the show on the road, even though there has been all of this turmoil and anguish and anxiety in the background, which I think is no mean feat. Oh, yeah. Well, I think they've done remarkably well, actually. It's about time we cut them a bit of slack. Yeah, it really is. Um, Camilla, we look forward to seeing you at 9.30. Thanks very much indeed. It's really interesting what you say as well about thinking about Prince William. Maybe not now, because he will step up to the plate. Mm. He'll shoulder the burdens. But, um, Later. Well, yeah, I, I, when, when I lost my little boy way back in 1991 um, and I was doing lots of interviews about it and started the campaign, a lot of the doctors I interviewed said, you shouldn't be doing this now. But if you have to, and I said, well, I have to. And they said, all right, but can you just look ahead in the diary? Six months from now, it will hit you like a sledgehammer. Yeah. And you must be prepared for that. And I'm glad they said that because I, I was then and I took some time off work and everything. And they need to be saying that to Prince William now. Mm. You're doing a fab job at the moment, you really are, keeping the family together, keeping the whole show on the road. But please think about yourself in about yeah. six months' time. September. And that means we've got to think of him too. Oh, yeah, we we've have. Got we've got to understand got a... that he's going to get hit by a, like a sledgehammer. He needs, you know, September to the end of the year, he should just have off. Yes, Dis he really should. Disappear. Absolutely disappear. And the only have problem for the time. monarchy then is what, it, you know, how is the king going to be then as well? So. But, well, but we, we were saying we, yesterday, we'll it time, for the, time for the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh. Um, to, I mean, I know they already do great work, but maybe they need. More. <laughs> more, well, and, more work. Uh, and Beatrice has been stepping Beatrice up and in Eugenie the last week maybe. or two. Yes. So, and they're on the list. Let's get, let's get them used a, a little bit Princess more. Princess Anne already works harder than almost anybody else. Doesn't she, Joss? But, 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 you know, if we have to cope without them doing as much as they were to. doing, then let's just do yeah. it. They've got to look after themselves. They really have in all of this. 
it's very important. It's literally life and death. You've got to look after yourself. Mm. Anyway, I shall tell him that when I see him. Well, I think so. In the meantime... Write to him. I, sh I should write to him. You should write to him saying that. Actually, that's not a bad idea. I think I that's a very good idea. That. Yeah. Um, right. As we prepare our notes for Prince William, uh, <laughs> we want to congratulate Charles from Stoke-on-Trent because he won the £18,000 Great British Giveaway. We know he watches, obviously, well, he should do, because that's how we knew how to enter. Hmm. He's got the prize money now in that bank account. Spend it wisely, Charles. Here's a moment we told him. Charles, I have some really good news for you. You're the winner of the Great British Giveaway. Oh, it's lovely, Nick. <laughs> You've won £18,000. That's a big surprise. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. Sounds, I said this yesterday, he sounds just like my father-in-law. <laughs> so <laughs> uncanny. I, need to, I do need to send him a text. Well, Charles was a great winner. You could be too with our latest giveaway, which is a shopping spree, a garden gadget bundle and £12,345 in cash. Here's all the details you need. Time is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and Privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Oh, yeah, Very good luck. Mm. Now, it's still to come for you. It is 80 years since the great escape. We're going to be talking to an RAF officer about that in just a moment. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Nana Queer. Weekends from 3pm. Seriously couldn't get my head around it. Electric ambulances. The government are planning to spend our money, over half a billion, on a fleet of electric net zero ambulances. Even being told this alarm bell should be ringing, most of the people I know who have an EV have got rid of it because of range anxiety and the inconvenience having simply just got too much for them, frankly. They never do as much as they say they won't, will anyway. First of all, they are totally impractical. The ambulances will take some four hours to charge each, so it will be out of action for that time. They will need space and individual chargers and having... And heaven forbid they need to do more than the 70 to 80 miles capability, which will be somewhat diminished depending on weather conditions and presumably the use of life-saving equipment to keep their patients alive, which I'm guessing will be powered by the same battery. Apparently, the NHS is committed to making all new emergency ambulances electric by 2030 and the entire fleet by 2045. In England alone, this would cost over £600 million. While electric cars don't produce any emissions from the tailpipe, there are emissions involved in the manufacture 
as well as the production of the electricity used to charge them. So anyone driving an EV thinking what a great job they're doing needs to think again. Ambulances are usually changed every five years and at about £150,000 per vehicle, the new EV version would need to be on the road for over 15 to make it commercially viable. So why should the public pay for this? In my view, it's commercially irresponsible and putting our lives at risk for the sake of an ever-questioning green agenda, which will bankrupt the country and is not in the best interest of the patients. Now, today marks 80 years since one of the most famous events in the Second World War, the Great Escape. Allies being kept in a prisoner of war camp in Germany devised an elaborate plan to dig tunnels right underneath the prison so that they could break free. It's an incredible story. If you know the movie, you'll know the story well. Uh, we're joined now by RAF officer Steve Parler from Poland. Oh, a very good morning to you. It's lovely to see you. Tell us morning, exactly you where both. you are, because I think you're at the site of one of the tunnels, aren't you? Indeed, this is Harry's Tunnel, which is the site of the Great Escape here at Stalaglyph 3 uh, in, at uh, Zagan in Poland. What, what's it like? I mean, I don't know if you've been there before, but what is it like to be there and to, and to see in real life something which has become something of legend, really? To say it's a privilege and an honour to be here with the Royal Air Force is an understatement. Um, you get a sense of pride, of you get the stillness now that I'm stood here in the woods and you're able just to sort of take a moment and just reflect about what it must have been like to sort of been tunnelling uh, that distance that they did and then realise you've come up short of the woods. It's been snowing. The moonlight is shining on the snow and reflecting and you, it must have been awe-inspiring but at the same time uh, very challenging for them to think, right, I've now got to try and get to the woods unseen, not uh, allow them to see me or my fellow escapees, and then try and make a home run back to the UK. Yeah, and they nearly made it, you could argue. But the, 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 all of the business we can see behind you is, I suppose, what's left. But it is remarkable that there is some of the tunnels, the various tunnels left, and all the bits and pieces that those remarkable um, airmen, most of them, managed to construct so that they could escape. Absolutely. The innovation uh, and the uh, skills that they showed, whether it be in forgery, in clothes making, uh, for making of documentation, um, coming up with their own stories. They used a whole myriad of, of different skill sets to, uh, to construct what was absol an absolute tremendous sort of uh, achievement and, uh, and act of escapism. Do, and we're here these... now, obviously, to try and, uh, to try and replicate that and to train our Royal Air Force aviators in those same skills. Well, I was going to say, do, do these men remain an inspiration not only for you but for new recruits as well? Absolutely. We're, we're sadly uh, not joined by people that survived the camp because, uh, at this time, but we're very much joined by families and friends that will be with us here today for the ceremony who relive the stories and are able to, to convey that message to the youngsters that I've got here with me today and they draw lots of strength and inspiration from that. And I know that they will be extremely proud in being here to represent the Royal Air Force at today's ceremony. Yeah, very important. It's interesting that where you're standing is almost where I imagine they would have come up from the tunnel, and you can see how exactly far short... This is exactly the point. Yeah, this exactly. This is exactly well, the you... point. There you go, exactly and you can see... exactly the point where they were. You can see that, you know, the, the wood is only just behind you, but you've got to get from there into the wood to be safe. And that was a very Indeed. dangerous... Well, when they came up out of the hole, the wood line that you can see now was actually another 30 feet back. Oh. So they were a little bit short. And hence, if you remember back from the film, they used a very ingenious technique with a rope. And then... So they would then um, uh, let the in next individual come in out when it was time and free to, for them to try and make that their successful escape. So uh, they had to be thinking on their feet, show the ingenuity, uh, just as today's Royal Air Force aviators are having to do all the time when they're defending the skies of the United Kingdom. 
Yeah, absolutely. Steve Parler, uh, it's fabulous to talk to you this morning. Yeah. I hope both you and those uh, young men and women that you're travelling with today uh, really benefit from that visit. Yeah, Thanks very much the indeed. Thank you. I mean, incredible for the thank young people. Thank you very much. People. We're very proud to be here and uh, thank you very much for We can hear the me. pride in your voice. We yeah. really can. Thank you. Thank right. you. We're okay. out of time. Uh, it's been good to have your company this morning. Camilla Tomin is here in just a moment. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Sunday promises to be a much quieter day weather-wise across the UK than on Saturday, drier, brighter and less blustery too. There are still one or two showers around today, particularly towards the north of Scotland, uh, still wintry across the hilltops there, but elsewhere the winds, as I say, are much lighter, more in the way of sunshine around, any showers very isolated, and with that extra bit of sunshine and the winds being that much lighter too, it should feel a bit warmer than on Saturday. Temperatures peaking in the south and southeast at around about 12 or 13.